The board superintendent search committee met to discuss the direction in which the board would take in the place of this I met with Kate and other consultants and our attorney to discuss the option to move the district forward. The board agreed that at this time the district needs stability and that this process needed to be completed and expeditiously. This was the overarching theme as we worked through this process. As the options were discussed, the board discussed the positive feedback received from different district members regarding Dr. Vasquez Marco's performance during his tenure with the district. Dr. Vasquez Marco became the acting superintendent at a very volatile time for the district. However, he handled the challenge.
uh, it's been a, a, a year of, of, of opportunity and hope. So thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, all who are present here tonight in this room and watching remotely. Mommy, they all want you. It is great, it is with great humility, zeal, and joy that accept the position of superintendent of schools. In October, we are appointed an acting superintendent. I stated the following in a letter to the community. As I step into this role, I do so with an unyielding commitment to students, faculty, staff, and family. Being an educator is my heart's work. It is at home, in community, and in school where children grow. These places, especially schools, are safe and supportive. Children flourish. As we move forward and through this period together, I pledge to you that I will lead Middletown Public School with students always at the center. As they are our future leaders, and their well being, along with their academic growth, is our guiding star. It is my sincere hope that since writing this letter eight months ago, members of the Middletown Public Schools community have seen evidence of my unyielding commitment to faculty, staff, families, and most importantly, our students. Additionally, I hope that I have demonstrated my core value, not just in words, but in my actions. We need to be proud because as a district, we have accomplished an enormous amount over these past eight months, and we still have an incredible amount of work to do. As I step into the role of superintendent, it is in the spirit of servant leadership that I do this with a heightened sense of urgency, a deepened understanding of the role and its responsibilities, and an unbreakable commitment to fostering healing, building trust, and co-creating a path forward for the entire district. I look forward to what lies ahead for us as we transform Middletown Public Schools into a district that recognizes and enhances each student's unique brilliance, gifts, and love of learning. Thank you. Thank you. I invite uh, Mr. Dave Reynolds to uh, come forward to uh, introduce uh, our career technical education uh, uh, program and uh, that guy and robotics program.
like I was saying, I'm getting part of it. And again, tolerating a new pathway coming into the Now, if I'm sure you notice, each pathway is not just a class of learning, it's also incorporated with strong cognitive learning components. These programs, be it robotics team or DACA, are these special sauce that makes that makes us feel so delicious, and it really takes learning to a whole new level. Uh, Mr. Elm is going to begin with our DACA portion of our audience. Thank you, thank you, PR, and thank you, Board of Education members. Congratulations again, Dr. Vasquez and thank you so much to the wonderful students that came tonight and the family that support that. Uh, my name is Dave Reynolds. I'm the coordinator for Career and Technical Education in the district. I'm also the tech advisor along with the VG and Schwartzman. And as I always like to add, uh, I'm the president. In fact, Mr. Walker very I'm so close that we can walk on after tonight's meeting. It's been a minute since our last visit because of the pandemic, but you definitely humble all of us with your information to your invitation tonight. I'd like to kick it off with a brief video. Mike. Why don't we go ahead and pause that mic and then I'll continue. Hopefully we'll get the video back at a later date or I can also email all the board members. This was a video that a student of ours that was not only kind of that, but also a video of Sebastian Nazari created for one of our state competitions. Middletown Decca now has 45th year uh, of serving the city of Middletown is a classic. Well, the theme of our presentation tonight is also a classic. It's centered around earth, wind, and fire. So, Anisha Douglas uh, will talk about the earth or the foundation of DECA. Abigail will talk about the wind in our students' sails, and Ralph will talk about the fire that burns in our DECA program. Anisha Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Good evening, distinguished board of educational members. My name is Anisha Douglas, and I am the DECA Vice President in Retail Operations. The Earth is the foundational question. What is DECA? DECA is an international organization of almost 200,000 members from more than 10 nations. The goal of DECA is to prepare emerging leaders in marketing, management, finance, and hospitality. But DECA is essential for any student that wants to be ready and lead in their communities and succeed in their college and careers. Middletown Becca is our state's largest and most successful Becca chapter. We have almost 200 members and actually represent all student demographics in both membership and leadership. And Middletown Becca has been proudly serving our city for 45 years. Now it's my pleasure to pass the podium to Abigail. Abigail? So much, Anisha. Good evening, Gordon, and I am the Vice President of Social Media Outreach here at our Milton chapter. As part of our presentation, Mr. Reynolds represents Earth, Wind, and Fire. So, why a variety of activities our students participate in here at Canada is the wind in their sails, guiding them on their journey of business. Each year, all of our students have equitable access to national co-curricular conferences such as the Washington, D.C. Power Grid, the Sports Entertainment Conference in Orlando, and the International Career Development Conference that Linda also has We also have local conferences on college campuses for leadership training and day trips to local businesses in New York City, just now, weekend, and Boston. Further, we have a great election process where we select our officers to move towards the membership, many of which are here today. We have a community service event, which is the Juvenile Diabetes Research Fund, Finding Workers, 
and the housing first that promotes local youth is the Elks Club. We have a holiday party in the house today at Vancouver Warriors, which is on quite soon. And we have a chamber of commerce breakfast, other than activities, and for funding our school retail operation, which is the chair of the does to get customers. So, of course, for our keystone event, the Dutch competition, I'm going to pass the podium to Ralph. Thank you, Ed. My name is John Parker, and I'm our Vice President of the District. The fire is the first priority to each staff member that joins our competition. At the heart of the deficit is an opportunity to safely learn, enhance it, and use it to compete at the state and international level. Survey after survey of employers clearly show that the number one skill they want in their employees and leaders is the ability to solve problems. That allows us to hold this skill to maximum, to maximum effect. In brief, during competition, students choose a category based on career interests, prepare to take rigorous content based written exams, and complete a series of impromptu problem solving case study presentations to industry judges. That is, students are given a real world business problem, and in just 10 to 30 minutes, prepare a full presentation to the judge. For example, at this year's international competition, which is like the Olympics of business education, where 18,000 students attended, I had to organize <coughs> almost 250 students from around the globe in a category called sports and entertainment marketing. To do this, I took a long written exam and performed three impromptu case studies. Each time, I didn't know what the situation was and only had 10 minutes to prepare my solution. One example of the case study was a summer baseball league. I was introduced to the Pittsburgh baseball team and it looked to me to see how much part of that team was doing for the city. Another one was an online streaming service that was shipping his wife to find and wanted to come up with that to turn up the prospect of customers. I was fortunate enough, using what I learned, to turn her an international class medal, an international gold medal, an international finals medal. An international top 10 medal and second in the world. I'll wrap this up by saying, as a chapter, we are akin to Jordan's goals in that our students prepare hard and dominate as in competitions. Just since 2000, our students have won seven of the state. 115 international medals. In the last four years, the state of Connecticut ranked marketing programs in the state. It'll have those number one. Now, please don't pass this today. We'll wrap this up. Thank you, Ralph. Good evening. My name is Dave Collins, and I'm a co president of the Milton Echo with ER. We conclude our presentation centered around birth, wind, and fire. Becoming a part of the Deco family was one of the best decisions that I made in high school. My older brother was in Deco before me, my younger brother is coming in next year, and the wide variety of opportunities it presents to all students is legendary. They all become shining stars. Finally, the success that you've heard of tonight is not possible without the unwavering support of so many people and organizations. While there are too numerous of us here tonight, we know that we appreciate you. It was our honor to present to you, and we would love to answer any questions that you might have.
No. We have, we have some other sound issues. So, before I conclude, I all students here and I understand. It's good to see you all. My name is Sam Falkenberry. I teach engineering robotics at Middletown High School, and I'm also the advisor for the robotics team. Um, with me tonight, I have a handful of some of Middletown's top robotics competitors. Um, their dedication and conviction throughout the season has been an inspiration to me um, and pushes me to be a better educator each day. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity to highlight our program. And at this time, I'd like to introduce a junior member of our team, Jack Killian, to kick us off. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Killian, and I'm a junior member of the Middletown High School Blue, or ja Blue Dragon Robotics team. Tonight, we'll start with a quick demo of our 2021-22 competition robot, aptly named Frank the Mechanical Bull. This season's primary competition scoring objective was to possess weighted mobile goals and balance them on an elevated platform. I'll give a quick demo. Now, I would like to introduce Mia to provide a brief overview of the, of the robotics team. Thank you, Jack. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mia Nino, and this is my first year on the Blue Dragon Robotics team. Each year, the team competes in the largest internationally recognized robotics team competition known as VEX Robotics. Students combine a real-world application of STEM concepts with teamwork, communication, and problem-solving skills. As one of the largest programs in the region, we continue to increase participation from traditionally underrepresented demographics and the STEM concentrations. We considered running an all-girls team this year, but decided it would not be fair for the competition. This coming season will be our 10-year milestone. Next, Owen is going to highlight some of the team's accomplishments throughout our season. Thank you, Mia, and thank you for everyone for the opportunity to highlight our team. My name is Owen DePoint, and as a senior member, I've been competing for three years on the robotics team. Um, from October to March, four MHS robotics teams competed in seven regional qualifiers and one national open hosted by the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. The amount of time many team members dedicate outside of scheduled class is extensive. Mr. F is actually pretty sure that some of us have changed our home address to the uh, robotics room. At each competition, teams have won awards in the following criteria head-to-head -head match rankings, individual robot programming challenges, engineering design portfolios and interviews, and sportsmanship. At a regional championship this past March, all four teams qualified for the 2022 Rex Robotics World Championship. Teams 9909W, Y, and F all qualified through reaching finals matches, while my senior team 9909C earned the Excellence Award at the, as the top ranked team out of all 100 competing. In order to be considered for this award, a team must be ranked highly in all aspects of the competition. 
with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Shrieker, who will highlight our experience at the World Championship. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Owen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to present ourselves. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shrikar Seishadri, and I am a junior member of the robotics team. This past May, we had 24 robotics team members spread across four teams travel to the VEX Robotics World Championship hosted in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Worlds presented an incredible educational opportunity to compete against the best 800 high school teams from over 30 nations. Over three full tournament days, our four teams competed in separate divisions of 100 teams each. Two of our teams, 9909F and 9909W, ranked in the top 16 for their division qualifiers. While all of our team members brought new experiences back from Dallas, two truly resonate from my time there. First, things don't always go the way that you plan, and that's okay. The important consideration is how you adjust to the situation. And something that resonates with me personally, uh, always keep track of your wallet. <laughs> Little guy tends to get away sometimes. Uh, and with that, thank you for this opportunity, and I would like to invite Sasha to conclude our program highlights. Thank you, Shrieker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Ziff, and I am a senior member of the MHS Blue Dragons robotics team. I would like to conclude our presentation by extending our appreciation for the opportunity to highlight both engineering education with the robotics team and marketing education with DECA. Each career and technical education program offers students much more than what their individual titles categorize. Students are presented the opportunity to develop skills which transcend the classroom, such as communication, teamwork, initiative, and problem-solving skills. Once again, thank you for your support. We truly appreciate what you continue to advocate for our programs. Um, I know Falconberry doesn't like us ad-libbing, but I would like to thank him for all that he has done for us this year. Um, this has been the best year so far, uh, and we couldn't have done it without him. Thanks, welcome. Home. Uh, and now I am open to any questions. Question? No question, another comment. Um, this is awesome, and I'm so glad to see the young ladies here that are also participating in this because this is really a male-dominated field, and it's so good that even in high school you all are interjecting yourself into robotics and STEM. So give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. It's so great seeing you. Thank you all, and, and good luck, and best of luck in your competitions forthcoming into this next school year as well. Thank you. Board members, tonight I also want to have the opportunity to um, highlight um, some of our educators who will be retiring uh, this year. You know, uh, throughout this academic year, we've talked a lot around recruitment and retention. And today is actually one of those highlights that really defines retention because they have dedicated many years of service to our, our students and our families um, uh, and have given countless hours and days um, um, to benefit and educate our students. And so um, I have a slide with their names. Some of them are, are present with us tonight. Um, if they're here, I'm going to ask them to please stand and remain standing um, this, um, as, as, to give us the opportunity to, to highlight and celebrate you. Um, we have Deborah Bailey, who uh, 25 years of service from Middletown High School, who taught grades 11 and 12 
AP Psychology. Janine Bazzano, seven years at Middletown High School. Sue Brown, 25 years of service at Middletown High School as a paraprofessional. Elizabeth Caffrey, 24 years of service at Farm Hill, teaching grade four. Sandra Cardella from Spencer. <laughs> Melanie Del Sol, 24 years of service at Moody, grade two. <laughs> Lynn De La Ventura, 24 years of service at Spencer, teaching kindergarten. Bonnie Gabbery, 15 years of service, Middletown High School as the coordinator of pupil services in special education. Robert Navasky, 25 years of service at Middletown High School. Maria Atfanaski, 28 years of service at Middletown High School, English language learning grades 6 to 12 and adult education ESL. Deidre Peterson, 39 years of service at Wesley. <laughs> Elizabeth Sitz, 20 years of service at Spencer, grade one. <laughs> Martin Skelly, 20 years of service at Bealfield, fourth grade. And those are our phenomenal educators who will be uh, opening a new chapter in their lives uh, very soon. So um, as superintendent, I want to thank you um, and wish you um, um, many joys and good things. <laughs> Madam Chair. By the way, if any of you would like to substitute, um, <laughs> please see Ms. Kanata on your way out. Or para. Or para. Good evening, everyone. Um, Jesse Lavornia, Director of Communications, for those who may not know. Um, I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing um, Mr. John Geary this evening, who recently um, won an award from the Connecticut Association of Schools. So I'm going to ask that Mr. Geary join me. And such is the life of um, uh, Mr. Uh, Byron was unable to be here this evening because his wife had awards night and he had his kids. So I, I will be I, I'm just meeting Mr. Geary now, but um, this is, it's wonderful that we get to highlight him. So Mr. John Geary, who is a veteran teacher coach advisor, has been named Connecticut Association of Schools CAS Exemplary Educator of the Year um, for the 21-22 school year. Each year, CAS, the Connecticut Association of Schools, awards this prestigious title to three Connecticut educators, one at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, the criteria um, for this award included excellence in the classroom, involvement with students, staff, and parents, and leadership in the profession. Um, Mr. Geary has been um, in the district for 45 years, which is just phenomenal. And, and so, and, yeah. in, in that time, Mr. Geary has taught social studies or history for Middletown Public Schools, and he has also coached middle school boys basketball, um, been student council advisor, and coached Middletown High School's varsity baseball team for 21 years, um, and they won a state championship in 1991. Um, Mr. Geary is a gem and a staple of the district of Middletown Public Schools. When the announcement was made that Mr. Geary was named Exemplary Educator of the Year, um, if you were on the email stream, <laughs> There were so many people. Everybody was just like, no, we're going to reply all to this. And it was just, absolutely, uh, of course you did. No kidding. Like, it was just, 
it was a given that he would win this award. Um, and so it is quite obvious that it is a well-deserved recognition. There was also a lovely um, uh, article about Mr. Geary in the Middletown Press, I believe, over the weekend, yesterday. I, yeah. So I'm going to let you say a couple words, if you don't mind. Oh, please do. Thank you. First, congratulations, Dr. Vasquez Mastos. All right. Um, I think that what happened with the, uh, the CAS award, they probably turned to the longevity part of their bylaws. So they figured that's what they would do. Uh, uh, obviously, this is kind of like full circle for me because now I have some former students that are my bosses on the Board of Education <laughs> and some in central office also. Uh, so I have to watch my step very quiet. Uh, again, they really putting in 45 years. I mean, when you have a labor of love and you really enjoy what you do, and you know, my students kind of are the, the wind beneath my wings. Right? I hate to kind of use that cliche, but that's really what it is. So when you love what you do and you see the success of the students that have come through your doors, I mean, that's really what you, why you're here. All right, and especially in the environment, we've gone through COVID and some kind of negative things happening. You know, you just want to be in that classroom with these students. And the success sometimes is not always in front of you as an eighth grade teacher, but it's as they move through life. And I think that one of our goals, we certainly like to have test scores are great, but your life skills are more important. They're going to take you farther. And I certainly the people that I hope have come through my door feel that way. That if I paid, played one little part in that successful life skill, then I consider myself very, very fortunate to do that. So I thank the board for recognizing my award with the cast. So thank you so much for this evening. Congratulations to you. Bless you, sir. Um, Mr. Gary was my teacher, and um, I think last year we were I took a picture with him, and um, I put it on Facebook, and I said, me and Mr. Gary at Beeman Middle School, and I mean all of the comments, everyone said, oh, Mr. Gary still looks great. Oh, Mr. Mr. Gary was such a wonderful teacher. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about people of all ages really just giving their praises to Mr. Gary. He's a gym in the district. He's such a great person. And um, even though we don't work directly, we did work together a couple of months ago with, you know, just updating some things at Beeman and just a kind and gentle soul. So keep up the good work, Mr. Gary. You are really great among men. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. I just want to share something about Mr. Gary. It's very important. I was a student of his. Oh, you're so sweet. But he's also had my children as students. And it's very emotional that I could speak this. Uh, one of my sons, they both played basketball, but one of my sons played basketball and was also a student. And that youngest student, which is my son, is now sitting in the NBA G League. But he came from under Mr. Gary. And even with the hardship of my son getting it, because there's usually 1% that make it, there's one thing that Mr. Gary did just before Elijah really started performing. He wrote letters. He wrote letters. It's always words of encouragement. Sent things through the mail and made phone calls and attended a lot of different events. If we just had a few more like him that would just wrap his arms around all children, around all of our children, and show them the path. Because some of us adults got to grow up, but that man over there, 45 years, he hasn't lapped one time of not showing his compassion, his love, his concern for children, parents, and a lot of outreach. Gary, I was a bad child, but thank you for wrapping your arms 
around me. Next up, we have um, we're, uh, highlighting our um, teachers who completed the teacher education and mentoring program, the team program uh, required by the uh, state of Connecticut. And uh, joining me this evening is our director of assessment, professional development, and instruction, Paul Griswold, who kind of leads this effort for the district. Mr. Griswold. Good evening, Chairwoman Kane, members of the board, and Superintendent Vasquez Matos. Um, so on this evening, um, I can't help but recognize the synergy of um, honoring and recognizing our retirees and all of their accomplishments through the course of their long careers, um, and at the same moment, uh, recognizing an accomplishment of teachers at the outset of their careers. So the teacher and education and the teacher education and mentoring program, or TEAM, is a state-mandated professional development and support program required of all new teachers in our state. In their first two to three years of teaching, beginning teachers participate in this rigorous professional learning process that guides their improvement through problem posing, action research, and reflection. Throughout their time in the team program, beginning teachers must set goals and demonstrate growth by completing a series of reflection papers. In the areas of classroom environment, planning, instruction, assessment, and professional responsibility. To support them through the program, each beginning teacher is paired with a specially trained mentor who is required to provide, to provide 50 hours of mentoring, and that does not include the countless hallway check-ins and emails. Tonight, Middletown Public Schools would like to recognize the hard work and dedication of 18 of our beginning teachers, along with their mentors who successfully completed the team program during the school year. Um, for those of you that are present, uh, when I read your name, please stand and remain standing. Um, and just so we can get through the list, we can recognize them with applause at the end of the list. Uh, so first um, to start is Liza Carpenter, a fifth grade teacher at Bealfield, mentored by Megan Heslin and Iced at Bealfield. Christina Serino and Marianne Intozik, both biology teachers at Middletown High. Cecilia Davila, and um, she's mentored by Dennis Luciano, both eighth grade Spanish teachers at Beeman. Stephanie Dombrowski, a third grade teacher at Bealfield, mentored by Diane Castagno, a first grade teacher at Bealfield. Julia Giattino, a music teacher at McDonough, who was mentored by Lauren Mikulak, our STEM coach at McDonough. Raylene Goff, music teacher at Spencer and Farm Hill, who was mentored by Elizabeth Reed, a music teacher at Lawrence. Emilce Gonzalez Perez was mentored by Sarah Esposito, both sixth grade Spanish teachers at Beeman. Dina Longatano was mentored by Mary Ellen Molsky, both English teachers at Middletown High. Megan Lynn was mentored by Mary Foley Marsalek, both social studies teachers at Middletown High. Sunita Midori, a third grade teacher at Lawrence, was mentored by Carrie Nelson, also a third grade teacher at Lawrence. Eric McDowell, a seventh grade social studies teacher at Beeman, was mentored by Liz Mancini, our social studies department head. Reed McFarland was mentored by Yolanda Hart, both special education teachers at Beeman. Julia Moon was mentored by Ryan Hunt, both science teachers at Middletown High. Bill Piper was mentored by Julie Pelzar, both sixth grade science teachers at Beeman. Rebecca Ruggiero is a music teacher at Snow, mentored by Lisa Keston Smith, a first grade teacher at Snow. Kelsey Simmons, a second grade teacher at Lawrence, mentored by Carrie Nelson, a third grade teacher at Lawrence. That's two mentorships for Carrie. Uh, Susan Velarde, second grade teacher at Bealfield, mentored by Kim Chocolo, a spiced uh, special education um, instructional specialist. And Daniel Wabno, sixth grade band director here at Beeman, who was mentored by Amy Krasanowski, our seventh and eighth grade band director here at Beeman. So if we could show our appreciation for these beginning teachers. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Griswold. 
Um, next up um, is our proclama proclamation for LGBTQ plus Pride Month um, for the month of June. Um, a director of communication, uh, Mrs. Nabornia. Good evening again. Um, so this is a proclamation for LGBTQ plus Pride Month, um, June 2022. <clears throat> Whereas the School District of Middletown Public Schools is deeply committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and boldly unlocking the potential in all students, and whereas members of the Middletown Public School community who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, plus other sexual orientations and or genders, LGBTQ+, contribute to our vibrant, diverse, and thriving school district, and whereas each year, LGBTQ+, LGBTQ plus Pride Month is celebrated nationally and locally during the month of June. This month was chosen to commemorate this month was chosen to commemorate the riots that took place on the morning of June 28, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in Manhattan, often viewed as the birth of the modern LGBTQ plus rights movement and whereas nationally and locally the tireless dedication of LGBTQ plus advocates and allies has brought about many hard-won victories towards increased acceptance. We acknowledge that the success of our community is largely measured by how we teach and nurture our young people. Therefore, it is imperative that we continue to work together in order to ensure that regardless of sexual orientation and or gender, gender identity, the youth in our community feel safe, seen, and supported. And now, therefore, on this day of June 14th, 2020, 2022, the School District of Middletown Public Schools and its Board of Education do hereby proclaim June 2022 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month with the acknowledgement that in increasing inclusive practices provides us all with safer and more welcoming places and spaces in which to live and learn. Thank you. Madam Chair, and that concludes my uh, district highlights. Positive um, <clears throat> section there today. So next on the agenda is public session. At this time, I'm going to open the floor for a public session. Anyone that addresses the mic will have three minutes to speak. I ask that you state your name, your address, and refrain from using any identifiers. Again, you have three minutes. The floor is open at this time. Good evening, everyone. Sandra Cardella, uh, Sonoma Lane, Middletown. I have to say, I, was, I really liked hearing all the uh, accolades to my, um, my colleagues, former colleagues, present colleagues, uh, new, new teachers, seasoned teachers. I'm, I'm really proud and I uh, applaud them for all their hard work. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Middletown. I'm a product of this school system and I've dedicated myself to the education of its children for the last 35 years. Wasn't on the slide, 35 years. Um, I've taught some of your children, and you can attest to the love, care, and dedication that I did my job with. And I gotta tell you, I was really good at my job. But I'm, real, I'm saddened, and I'm gonna share with you why, because I don't think you really know what is going on with your staff and in your schools. Um, you're failing your staff, and in turn, you're failing the students of Middletown. I'd like to begin by looking at the math exodus of master teachers and administrative staff that have taken place over the past few years. How many staff have left during this past school year alone? How many more are leaving at the end of this school year? Yes, some are retiring, perhaps early, as myself, while others are joining nearby school systems. That's their gain and sadly Middletown's loss. I myself was originally going to teach two more years, but sadly I decided that I was tired of my knowledge and my expertise being ignored. I was tired of more and more being put on my plate 
while nothing is ever taken off. And I'm not alone. I was tired of being forced to implement what I knew were developmentally inappropriate initiatives and being told at many levels, it is what it is, do your job. Your staff, do you know what your staff is asked to do? You're asked to, they are asked to pilot, pilot, and provide feedback on programs that have already been purchased. Then that feedback is ignored while more dollars are spent. Your staff is asked to sit for hours and hours of professional development tied to countless number of new initiatives when a better use of their time and the city's money would be to work with their building teams mastering the many initiatives that are already in place. Your staff is asked to test, test, and test again, taking away much too much time from direct instruction of our students. Your staff is asked to fill out mountains of paperwork that have no direct impact on the day-to-day -day workings of our classrooms, other than taking away precious, precious time that should be spent with our students or collaborating with our colleagues. Pardon? It's been three minutes. It has been. Sorry. Okay, I'll forward you. If the you want to email it, yeah, you I can will. Email it. I'm just asking, please do better before you lose more quality teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education members. Janice Pollack, Brookview Lane, Middletown, Connecticut. I'm here this evening with Cindy Culp and Greg and Brooke Harda. We are the Middletown Coalition of Unions. First, I'd like to thank, um, welcome Dr. Matos officially to Middletown Public Schools. Um, we already have a working relationship with him, but this is, we are now asking to have a working relationship with you, the board. Um, in October of 2021, we came forward with serious concerns of longstanding toxic working conditions at Middletown Public Schools that were being created by the members, some members of the senior management team. It has been eight months since this was brought to your attention, yet we haven't had substantive corrective action, and we really need that to be happening. While we understand the investigatory progress was long and multifaceted, the time for action is now. As the school year comes to a close, we are asking for corrective measures to be put into place immediately. The dedicated and hardworking professionals we represent deserve no less. With staff shortages, a global pandemic, and recent nationwide school violence incidences, weighing on our minds and hearts. Um, it's simply unfair to let these old wounds just remain open. We are imploring you to take corrective actions necessary now that you have the full investi uh, investigatory report, you findings. Take action and put in the safety nets required to not only help the district staff heal, but ensure that nothing like this ever happens again. So we are asking that you take personnel action against the administrators that were, uh, that were allegations were substantiated. We're asking that you schedule and conduct a restorative circle with uh, representatives from the elected Board of Education, administration, city leaders, and union leaders. Uh, the district is best served if we can all work together in a transparent, open dialogue between the city government and everyone involved. Um, establish a committee made up of elected BOE member representation administrator representation, union leaders, and a small sampling of employees to take up key workplace issues such as policies, procedures, and processes that need updating or help implementing. If we'd had such a committee, we believe that the issues brought to, that were brought to you in October would have been addressed in a more, um, in a manner that wouldn't have caused as much harm. Uh, the existing complaint process failed our employees. This committee could also be crucial for, to formulating and revising the district's strategic operating plan. We are also asking that you establish mental health supports for all employees in need and communicate these to the entire district. Some, employ, some unions are aware of these issues, uh, this help, not all employees are aware. Um, prioritize and the backfilling of open positions in the district to relieve the pressures due to extreme staff shortages. Uh, there, we have very uh, many critical vacancies at all levels of our organization. Um, we are also asking that we, that we seek, all of us seek the help of the Middletown community organizations 
to repair the relationships and to create an inclusive plan moving forward, including training resources, hiring practices that promote the true mission of inclusivity for all of Middletown Public Schools. And also to finalize and implement a robust exit interview process that is transparent and public so the district can truly learn and improve on the pain points that are causing staff to leave the district. This data is crucial to nip any potential problems in the bud. And we suggest that these results be regularly reported to the Board of Education, as well as newly formed committee that we recommended in item number three. Um, At the call time. Oh. Brooke Carter, 9, uh, 905 Millbrook Road. I relinquished my five minutes to Janice Pollock. Uh, three minutes. Right. Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to I'm do about to two. say, don't try to start your new rules tonight. <laughs> forgot, forgot. Okay. The Common Council. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll try to do it in two. Okay. Um, it's time to begin the healing process and take steps to rebuild trust amongst district employees, improve communication, increase transparency, streamline our district operations, and plan for the future. If we work together with your workforce, not in opposition with us, only then can our staff provide the best experience for our students and unlock the potential for us all. So please join us and work to make Middletown Public Schools the premier district in the state of Connecticut, where we recruit the highest quality candidates, staff stay because of high morale and support, and most importantly, our students receive a superior education, a safe, warm, welcoming, diverse, and inclusive environment. Communications like these typically go unanswered. It fuels the perception that things will never change, nobody cares, in my opinion, doesn't matter. So we hear regularly from our member members. So we're asking that this communication please be answered. Don't let it go unanswered and stand with us so that we can get to work. Sincerely, the coalition. It's for a public session. Any other public comments? Do you have anyone online? No? Okay. Any comments? Any comments? Any comments? Public session is closed. Thank you. And at this time, we'll go to the communication portion of our agenda. And at this time, we'll ask um, Ms. Pilar Brooks to come with the report of student representatives. You have the floor, Ms. Brooks. My bad. <laughs> Okay. No. That mic's on. That's why. Okay. You didn't do anything wrong. Is it good? Okay. Greetings, everyone. I would like to thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Vasquez Matos, our new superintendent, um, for the opportunity to represent the student body at MHS once again. My name is Pilar Brooks, and I am proud and ready for summer vacation, junior of the class of 2023. For starters, let's just give a round of another round of applause to the four teams, um, boys golf, MHS baseball, um, sorry, MHS baseball. Um, Ultimate Frisbee and Unified Sports, just for all the accomplishments that they've had in their season. They had a very successful season. <laughs> Boys Golf had a great um, season where they were the champs of their conference. Uh, they carried the weight of being the greatest of all time, and they finished their season undefeated. Uh, and they just, oh my God, why do I keep saying that? Baseball team, um, they made the quarterfinals for the first time in 31 years. Um, and they're still going. Ultimate Frisbee are once again the champs of their conference for the third year in a row. And Unified Sports is the first ever Cornhole Champions of 2022. <laughs> the past events that we've had um, in the school community, uh, we had Community Day, which was a field day, but we also had like a little twist to it where we were able to just be kids once again. Um, there were bounce houses, open fields so we could play football. There was music, rock climbing. I'm not going to lie. I was being the 10 year old. I was having a lot of fun. Um, Diversity Day, we had like a musical concert where there was a bunch of like different types of music. And they were, I don't remember where they were from, but they were like new artists just trying to get their name out. It was cool. Um, 
we had the spring sports recognition banquet. We had a spring concert for all of our music programs, the BOAG open house, BOAG banquet, aerospace field trip, uh, the fine arts banquet, our national honor society induction, and our DEI junior change agents field trip. That was to an African American museum. I went and it was so nice. I loved it. And before I continue, I'm going to briefly speak about the DEI change agent group. Um, DEI stands for diversity. Can you hear me? Okay. Anyway, um, it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion for any students interested. We are a group that supports and is willing to. Um, we support and are willing to act on any change that's necessary for students. Um, in DEI, we are taught about, we are taught all of the, oh my gosh, I wrote this wrong. Okay, I'm sorry. We are taught of all of the inequities and build a vocabulary based on issues that are common in schools. Um, we learn to identify and react to these issues in ways to keep the situation cool, if they've ever happened in the school community. Um, right now, we further our knowledge in these issues um, by working to find a way to make changes in school through students and the best part of the meeting to me is taking a break and dissecting everything that we've learned with students. We learn with DEI placemats, which provide definitions of the DEI equity symposium. We take field trips, and we have recently been asked to write our culture stories as a way to grab the attention of adults to advance racial equity conversations in the district. This being said, as a member of the junior DEI change agents, please encourage your children to join our group and help us make change in our school. Now back to the rest of school. Okay, we've had senior events, which was uh, pa um, past ones were yearbook signing, the senior ball, which everyone looked great, senior awards, and the senior picnic. And for the last upcoming events for the class 2022, graduation. Graduation will be held at the high school on June 25th at 11 o'clock a.m. And for the rest of the school, our final exams, which will start this Thursday and end next Thursday, just a reminder, we start school at normal time and we end at 11 o'clock. For all of us who attend Middletown High School, the schedule for next week and a little bit of this week is Thursdays and Thursday and Friday we have periods one and two and three and four for our finals. There's no school Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday we have five and six and seven and eight. Thursday will be a makeup day and then end of school finally. Um, are there any questions? No? Well, thank you so much for having me this year, and I look forward to seeing all of you guys next year. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. I definitely see the growth as you, um, from when we started in September. And I can tell you really like this, so, um, Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks. All right. The next um, item on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda items. <clears throat> I hope you guys all had some time to read everything. So definitely a lot of information. Um, does anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda items A through P? Anyone want to remove anything? No? Okay, is there a motion to accept consent agenda items A through P? So moved, John Polino. Moved by John Polino, is there a second? Second by Anita Dempsey-White, any questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried and the consent agenda items are approved. Next on the agenda is Super, excuse me, department reports. Um, and at this time, we'll call Ms. Cheryl Wilkett to the floor.
Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Congratulations, Dr. V. I'm very excited. Good evening, board members. Um, last night we had our budget meeting, which we went over the transfers um, pretty extensively. So I'm going to ask right away, does anybody have any questions on any of the transfers, especially any of those who weren't a part of last night's meeting? I'll hit on a, cu a couple. Um, one of the big ones was to do a budget transfer to pay the energy performance contract lease payment. And then there was a transfer for security round five um, local match money that would come from the Board of Ed funds. Does anybody have any questions on the transfers? And then the financial statement, um, go right to the last page and I'm projecting a $876,076.76. That's why I love numbers, by the way, just so you know. Um, so we're right around where we thought we would be and that still leaves the money for the athletic field intact. Um, does anybody have any questions on the financial statement? Okay. Here's for Cheryl. And if you do think of any, you know you can email me. I'm always available. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And thank you for your hard work, you and the money team this year, that I affectionately call you all. You had... Um, My pleasure. You guys had a tough spin, and um, we thank you for all of the work and extra hours. And just stepping up, because I know it was a little difficult, so thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, um, seeing that there are, are any questions in regards to the line item transfer, is there a motion to accept the line item transfer? Charles, uh, second. What would you do? <laughs> this says so moved, and then we'll so get a second. Yeah. Okay, so that was moved by um, Charles. Is there a second? Second. Second by Justin. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are no, the motion is carried. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to move. We, we have a lot of um, presentations tonight. I'm going to move swiftly through the department reports. Thank you all for coming out. Um, but I'm just going to see, do we have any questions for the facilities department? No questions? Thank you, Kevin. Um, any questions um, in regards to the personnel report? None. If so, please contact Dr. Vasquez Matos if you have any questions. Transportation report. Any questions for transportation? Okay, there are none. You're all set. No, we don't need you. You're all set. You don't have to say anything. Unless you want to say something. You have, you know? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. All right. At this point, we're going to move to superintendent's report. Dr. V, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Tonight we want to kind of um, uh, provide some updates on um, some initiatives that we've been um, uh, working on throughout the academic year. Um, we've heard from our student representative, uh, Pilar, her experience with uh, DEI uh, junior change agents. So I want, I want to invite our Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, uh, doc, Dr. Jada Waters, um, who will kind of um, give us a high level of the work. We did uh, provide these uh, presentations um, uh, to the board previously to give time for the boards to review them. Um, Dr. Waters. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Dr. Zeta Waters and I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and I'm so excited to be here tonight speaking on behalf of the board and also want to give a big congratulations to Dr. V for all of your hard work and also the admin team and everyone in Middletown Public Schools who've just come together and, and done great work for the end of this year. I do have a presentation. I sent the slides 
to the board um, to allow you to look through it and hopefully you'll be able to ask me some um, questions that you may have. The presentation that I am gonna do here tonight is gonna be the abbreviated version of it just because I have a limited amount of time to speak here. And I also wanna say that I am also a proud student who had the honor of having Mr. Gary and the only reason why he's not in this presentation is because he asked me not to put him in it when we took a selfie, so. So welcome to the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Again, my name is Dr. Waters, next slide. So have you met Dr. Waters? I purposely put these pictures here because this is a true testament to how things could just come back full circle. So that's me as a baby, that's me as a graduate of Middletown Public Schools, and that is the adult Dr. Waters who's currently working right now to help carry out the DEI initiatives. So everyone wants to know, like, who is this lady with this long, fancy title, diversity? the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So let me just break it down for you. Diversity is the variance of people. It's more than just gender and race. It includes culture, abilities, disabilities, social economic status, education, and gender expression. Equity is fairness, providing everyone equal access to the resources that they need in order to engage and participate fully. Inclusion. Inclusion is ensuring that everyone feels welcome and included, and also us being intentional and making sure that we give people an opportunity to share their story. So let me just tell you a little bit about what my role is, because I think that many people may have like their own perceptions of what they think my role is. So I just want to give you a brief overview, a small snapshot of some of the things that I do. So I promote DEI initiatives within the district. I reimagine systems and policies that create barriers. I lead difficult conversations, um, facilitate professional learning, research best practices on the district and the state level. I gather stakeholder data and support for action planning. I center students' voices at the center. Um, and Peeler did a really good job explaining that. Um, placemaking and culture celebrations, and I also earned the title of the direct um, of the district Title IX coordinator. What my role is not. So I am not a know-it-all. I am not judgmental. I am not a box checker. I, I don't check off boxes. Um, and I'm not a disciplinary. And I'm also not the race whisperer. So I just want people to know that in full disclosure. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I've been here seven months tomorrow. Tomorrow is my seventh month anniversary working in a district. And I just wanted to highlight what I've done in the past six months. So starting off, I started November 15, 2021. Um, I did equity walks throughout all of the schools. So I had the opportunity to go into every single one of the schools, meet with administration, meet with the teachers, get to sit in classrooms to see what our students' experience was, wanting to know if it was a welcome environment, did it have posters that represented all cultures? So I had the opportunity to do that. I did a meet and greet breakfast with MHS students. I had the opportunity to run restorative circles at the elementary school level and middle school level and high school level with not only just students, but adults and staff members. I have to tell you the elementary school students, they do it so well. We could learn so much from them um, as far as restorative circles. I did a lot of different community collaborations. We um, did a school climate survey. I have the opportunity to restructure what DEI and restorative coaching looks like in our district and also restructure our district equity leadership team, um, created and implemented a junior DEI change agent program, which was a response from our school climate survey. Um, building a community with different DEI stakeholders in Connecticut. So there is a group of DEI directors in the state of Connecticut that I get to work and collaborate with and share best practices. And in collaboration with HR, I do look at all the job descriptions and I make sure that we are creating job descriptions with an equity lens and I look forward to doing more work with HR with recruitment and retention practices. So I just wanted to highlight some of the equity walk feedback. So for the district equity coaching feedback, there was a lot of 
excitement about doing the equity work, but a lot of hesitation about re-engaging into the equity work because of the way it was implemented in the past. So some people felt like it started off really great. Some people felt like they were doing like a lot of different things. So I wanted to make sure that I was listening to the feedback that I heard. So when I decided to restructure what this work looks like for the district, that it needed to look different. It needed to look different, it needed to feel different, and we needed to do a different approach. So instead of having a equity coach and a restorative coach, you can't do one, one without the other. Um, so I merged both of the positions together and created the DEI change agents. And the reason why I chose DEI change agents because the work that we're trying to do in the district is transformative. Right? It does not happen overnight. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes trust, it takes building relationships, and you also have to empower people and make them feel like they're a part of the work, and you have to have a commitment to meeting people where they are. No matter where we think people should be, we have to meet them where they are and create safe and brave spaces. So I just thought with the title of that, changing the title, people would want to engage in the work because it's different. So reimagining and restructuring equity in restorative coach positions, so the DEI change agents, um, they serve as support, support for facilitating challenging conversations at their schools and um, for, the, for the community, for their building. They also assist their principals with difficult conversations and also support with some of the discipline stuff, and that's something that we're still working on looking at that multi-tiered system. And our mission is to dismantle racism for marginalized groups and foster an environment where high academic and social emotional wellness for all. Um, and our vision is an inclusive response and respectful learning environment where all students have the greatest access, opportunity, support, and achievement. So our DEI data, I think it's just important for you to know this. When I came into the district, there were 32 restorative um, coaches and equity coaches. I did put out a survey back in January to see who was still interested in doing the work after I did my walkthroughs. So I had 22 people complete the equity interest survey. 16 continued to do the equity journey with me. Um, and some of the reasons why people did not return to the work was retirement, FMLA, um, the time commitment looked very different from what the time commitment was before. If you're really going to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion and carry it out in a school, you have to have professional learning that's grounded in research. And that takes time. That is not an hour worth of training. That is three hours worth of training. So the folks who signed on with me committed to meet with me and our um, consultant three hours a month per month, once a month, so every Thursday, one Thursday per month, we met for three hours and we engaged in professional learning. And um, the time commitment was huge for folks because they, it, that was not their commitment before. And also, a lot of people did not want to engage in work because of the current culture and climate of the district at the time when I started in the work. So to have 16, I know it's half, but to have 16, I mean, that's huge. We're starting off, so. Just want to give our coaches a, a round of applause. I did provide you all with the outcomes of our learning sessions, which I know you have the opportunity to read through, but I thought it was really important to highlight some of the responses from the staff. So some of the things that people said was that I'm glad that this work is coming back into an official capacity. I'm very interested, but also worried about managing the workload this year since we are all on the verge of burnout. So I, I read that one on purpose only because once we were able to meet in our sessions, I felt like in the group report that it was a space for them to unwind and actually talk about like their day-to-day -day and share best practices with one another. So some of the feedback from the professional learning survey is when you hear the name DEI change agent, what about what does that mean to you? So some people wrote that I think of being a person who, I think of it as being a person who will facilitate change and transformation. And the scope of DEI at my school and ideally that the change will then ripple out beyond the scope of the school to truly work towards systemic change. Is there any way you can make that a little bigger, Mike? Thank you. Sorry, I have my glasses on today, but I can't see. 
Um, and then the other part is uh, someone who is empowering teachers and also students to disrupt the norm, sorry, the norm for the better of all of our students. And I do apologize, I really am having a hard time seeing this. Really good. No? Okay, can I move over a little bit? Yeah, can I, I speak really loud. Can I move over just a little bit? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> so the next question was, identifying things that you learn from professional learning. We all want to do what's best for our students. So being vulnerable is critical to teaching and learning. Our district seems to be to be really listening. And for me, that was really powerful because, again, I did the equity walks. I had the opportunity to meet with the equity coaches and restorative coaches, and I heard what they said, and I came up with a plan based off of the data that I collected and designed a program that was personalized for their needs. And I just think that that was really powerful for you all to hear. So here's a picture of our junior DEI change agent. So we did a school climate survey back in February, and this is a response to the school climate survey. So when we did the school climate survey, students were talking about inequities that they had in school, and they didn't really have the language, but they knew exactly what they were talking about. They knew that they, there wasn't a sense of belonging. They knew that their voices weren't heard, and I said, what can we do? We're already doing this learning with adults. How great would it be to provide our students with that same type of learning. So I sent out a survey wanting to know who was interested in doing this work and engaging in this leadership opportunity, and I had 15 students respond. And I would like to share with you what the survey consisted of. So one of the questions was, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you? Students aren't copy and pasted. They are all unique. Schools need to, to be diversified to accommodate every unique student's needs. Inclusion is absolutely crucial in maintaining a successful environment as it allows everybody to thrive. It's treating everyone as being human. What are three changes you would like to see happen in the district? One, more awareness for equity and inclusion, more action when negative situations occur, racism towards others as an example, more training and practice on equity being enforced to ensure that all students feel comfortable while in Middletown. That is very powerful. This is the pretest of knowledge before we even engaged in the work. This is what our students are saying. So learning, here's some pictures of learning that we've done. We started, we launched in, December, in March of 2022 and we've just been meeting monthly. So our students have the opportunity to build common ground and talk about what their greatest and greatest fears are for students in Middletown. They have the opportunity to read case studies of other students who were dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in their school district and we were able to unpack that and use our placemats that Pilar talked about on how we could be more solution focused to these issues. We, our students are currently right now writing their own culture story, sharing data with us about the work that needs to happen in the school, what their experience is like in the high school, what their experience was like in, in the elementary school, in the classroom, they're writing their own culture stories. Our students also have the opportunity to go to the first Black History Museum in Connecticut yesterday. It was an amazing field trip. They had a great time and they want to do this annually and get other students exposed to it. And then some of our students also help organize the walkout. Without my knowledge, they told me as we were doing the walkout that they helped organize it, but at least they were able to do it in a safe way. So the next thing is our district equity leadership team, which is our DELT team. And that team is to lead and facilitate change in action and policies to ensure equity for all students in Middletown Public Schools. This team will accomplish through collaborations with internal and external stakeholders and district leadership to develop an action plan for change. So unlike our 
district equity leadership team in the past. This is an internal team. I felt like it was really important to have leaders in the Middletown school, in the Middletown public schools to be a part of this team. And then we could have community members engage in our Delta A, um, also known as Delta, because then they'll be able to support us first. But we need to do some grassroots work within our own institution before we bring it out to the public. So the current work that we're working on is building common ground because again, we needed to build trust with one another. We took a deep dive in unpacking the racial equity plan. I know everyone's like, okay, give me the meat and potatoes. What are you doing with the racial equity plan? So we have the opportunity to read through the racial equity plan and unpack it and review an action resource planning guide that really pushed us to think about what are some of the threats, what are some of the challenges that we may face while we're developing this racial equity plan. So we noticed that the plan was adopted from Seattle and we recognize that we don't serve students in Seattle, we serve students in Middletown. How are we gonna create an equity plan based off of someone else's school district that does not have the same demographics as us? We just, we're not about adopting stuff, we're about doing grassroots stuff. So the work that we do with the junior DEI change agents and the work that we do with our teachers who are ch change agents in our building, we are collecting that data to create a racial equity plan that is using data from our old school so we could personalize it for our district, so it could be the blueprint for other policies that are gonna be passed and put into place. And I know that we want to, to have this plan done quickly, but in order to do it in a way where it's effective and sufficient and we're bringing people to have a seat at the table, it's important for us to make sure that we're getting all the stakeholders' voices. So that's where we are with that. So our next steps is, they, our group is doing a very close read of the SOP, and we're, we will restructure the current equity plan, and right now we're looking at the Montgomery County Schools racial equity plan that was passed, and we hope to have a draft, our first draft completed by the end of the summer. So that's where we are with that. I know that's what everybody was waiting for. <laughs> um, so this is a really quick picture. This is me with our statewide DEI practitioners where we basically we come together and share best practices. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so professional development, these two pictures are very critical to what we've been saying in all of the board meetings, the importance of hiring and retaining quality people of color. So this is myself and Dr. Dawn Brooks. Dr. Dawn Brooks is actually a teacher of mine and also a proud graduate of 1990 of Middletown Public Schools and so am I. So I went to a summit for DEI that had a focus in HR where we talked about how do we grow and retain our own and I feel like me and Dr. Brooks are a product of growing and retaining our own. In this picture on the left, we went to a conference, myself and um, Vasiana Spalding, that had a focus on equity and also social emotional learning. And the conference was titled, Equity is Love and Action. So I took a picture of Ms. Gervais, who was my fourth grade teacher at Lawrence School, who's also a first grade teacher at Lawrence School now. She switched from fourth to first. Um, she is the embodiment of equity is love in action because I actually was switched in her class mid-year because my teacher couldn't deal with me. So they put me in her class. And if I wasn't put in her class, I would not be the educator I am today. So I just wanna give her her flowers while she's here. And I also took a picture of Mr. Geary, and as I said, he didn't let me put it up there, but he is also the embodiment of equity is love and action. So we have great people working in our district right now. And when you listen to the people who retired 15 years, 20 years, 29 years, 35 years, people are working here, they're staying, they're invested in our students. Like we have to, use what we have and provide them what they need by listening to them. So this picture is really important. A picture is worth a thousand words and this picture represents the next steps. So I have the students stand to your left if you feel like school is a place where you belong and it reminds you of home. Stand in the middle if it's a mix and stand to your right if you do not feel like school is a place where you feel like you belong and it's a place that represents home. And if you notice, the majority of the students are on the right side. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. So our next steps is to ensure that we continue with the program that we started in the Office of, De 
in the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion by continuing the professional learning with the DEI change agents, collecting data, continuing collecting data from our students because a part of our strategic operating plan is that students are at the center. So continuing to collect that data to create a racial equity plan and to create a plan that's going to bring our students to the left side where they feel like they belong at school. And we want to be, make sure that we are empowering our teachers to create an environment where they want to come to work, where they feel like they're being heard. So those are our next steps. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, Madam Chair, just to add to Dr. Waters, um, as, a re as a reminder, this is, this, this is an important priority for the board. Um, and so this is um, uh, the work that is coming out from the equity plan that the board um, requested um, about a year ago, a year, or even two years ago. Um, and these are the, this is the fruits of those labors of the work that's being done and, and the work that needs to continue to be done. Um, and so, but you know, to Dr. Waters' point, um, one of the things that we also learned in this process, it, it, it's not just at the school level, it's every single level of the district that needs to be engaged in this work. Um, and so we are all, even at uh, central offices and different offices, all, you know, um, uh, in one way or the other, involved in this work as well. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I know you are just peeling the first layer back and there is so much more to do, but I wondered if there were future plans to bring junior DEIs even into the lower levels because I imagine that the fruit of the labor that is being put forth, like Pilar, won't really see it until she comes back full circle, which is never too late but um, how empowering it might be that these younger, the younger generation have these tools, this language, and, and this knowledge to do the work on the way up so we can all Absolutely. have checks and balances. Absolutely, I'm so glad you brought that up. So yes, there is plans to have a small pilot program of junior DEI change agents in the middle school. And I've been in conversation with Mr. Byron about a program that Mr. Gary used to run. I forgot the name of it. It's like a student empowerment program that talked about like bullying and I wanted to figure out how we could do the bullying and the equity work mm -hmm. together. So that's a partnership that we plan on doing, but I did budget out money to run a similar program in the middle school. And my goal is to have something at the elementary school level, just because some of the restorative circles that I had at the elementary school, they taught me so much about learning and adult learners, right? So sometimes someone may say something it may have hurt your feelings, but I didn't intend to hurt your feelings. So having that restorative circle, you have little ones like, well, I didn't really mean to say that. I, I like you, I didn't mean to say that. So that that's a part of the equity work too. So I would left, definitely like to branch it out to the elementary school level, but there is a plan to do it for middle school next year. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, I'd just like to say this is really tough work. And as much as people said the district needs healing, this is very much a part of it as well. So I ask people to <clears throat> definitely participate in this because this is part of the healing. Everyone needs this. So thank you for your work and um, I look forward to what you present to us in September. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. And I also thank you for trusting the process and really believing that my leadership is gonna take us to the next level. Dr. Thank Morris, you. can I ask a question before you step yeah, away? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the equity walkthrough. So did yep. you create some sort of rubric or were you using a rubric that was already available and could you share that with the board? So I did not create a rubric and nor did I use a rubric that was already available. I wanted to, to be an organic experience. So I wanted to go into the school with the mindset of me being a student, with me being a parent, and also with me being an employee. So literally, when I walked through the school, I went into the main office and I kind of just stood there. Am I gonna be greeted? Am I not gonna be greeted? When I walked into the classrooms, I wanted to see how the kids were gonna interact because they didn't know me. Could I be observing the teacher? Could I not be? observing the teacher. So I wanted to get a true 
organic experience. I did not have a rubric. I could implement that for walkthroughs in the future, but I wanted to get the real experience of what it's like being a person at a school. So whether I was being a parent, whether I was being a student, did it seem welcoming? Did I feel like I belonged? That was really important to me. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair and Dr. Waters, may I ask one more question? Could you give a shameless plug because there are folks that might be online who don't know or this might be their first time hearing about this work. So in the future, will there be something on the web page? How can students apply or get Absolutely. involved? And do you have to be a member or can you just kind of do some side work? Or how does that work? Really good question. Um, so. I know that I'm working with Jesse Lavornia and also Mike Scott because we just got a brand new website where I would be updating the information about myself, what I do, and then also folks could learn about who their DEI change agent is in their building. So we'll do a picture and a, a mini bio. And also for the students, we have our professional learning calendar that is already completed for the administrators to see. So the way it's set up is that we'll be engaging in professional development which will be posted and then there'll be an opportunity for the DEI change agents to share their learning with their staff members and then we will be collecting data at the end of each session to see whether or not we need to readjust and then that data will be shared with the school administrator um, so we could figure out how we could personalize it for the school. As far as getting information on how you could get involved, we'll create a page where if you're interested, you'll be able to click on a link and I'll be able to contact you um, if you wanted to get involved in the work. Unfortunately, well, I would say fortunately, when I started, I didn't have an opportunity to kind of just learn the position. I literally jumped in and started working on day two. Um, so there, usually people get the privilege of like learning the work for the year for the first year, but for my first six months, I just jumped into the work. So this summer, I plan on doing multiple activities with the community and having more visibility in the buildings, not just for support, but just being a part of the school community buildings. Two recommendations to happen to that phenomenal DECA marketing uh, team so to we have get two you a members. social media page yeah. going. But um, on my last comment or statement or question is we, and, and this is not a reference, this is a reference to a public comment that just took place, but I'm, how will your work, how will the DEI work work collaboratively with the unions who have just stepped forth and asked for healing and collaboration. I, I just envision that you might have, your work may have a significant role in that. And I don't know if that's for you, Dr. V, or just wanted to put that That's a there. really good question because actually the president of the union is a DEI change agent and also a district equity leader. So we, the president of the unit, union, Janice Pollack, serves on two roles with the equity work. She's fully aware. So we work in collaboration to ensure that we are creating a safe and brave space. And I wanna keep saying that, like a safe and brave space for people to be vulnerable, for adult learners to be vulnerable, for them to be able to ask questions without feeling guilty or without being accused of something. So like I'm working in close collaboration with not only Janice, but also Brooke when it comes to like designing job descriptions and making sure that we're doing it with an equity lens, we're collaborating because one of the things is like, Sometimes people do a lot of good work in silos and then people are like, I, I had no idea this was going on. Like, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. And that can't be anymore. We just can't have that. It's, it's unacceptable. And we know better. So <laughs> we're going to do better. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I had no knowledge of that. So I think that that is very important, not only for the board to hear, but the community at large. Absolutely. So it debunks, debunks any myths or thoughts or ideas. Thank you. No problem. And please reach out to me on the website for any other questions. Thank you. Just want to say congratulations and continue to keep up the good work. Okay. And I was just wondering, have, since you've been in this specific role, have you found any barriers, you know, since walking through the schools or, you know, have, having some fun with the kids and the teachers. Just a, a simple example, because I think that's pretty important because there is another side of the community 
that um, some of us foster as well, and they want to know, are there any barriers that they are up against that is not being exposed at this point? So that's a really good question. I would say, yes, there's a lot of systemic barriers that are in the way. Um, and a lot of times we get in the mindset, like this is a system, this is how it's always been. And you have like gatekeepers of information and not to put Dr. V on the spot, but like the one thing that I appreciate about his leadership and being on his leadership team is that we're fully aware about what's going on and we have a seat at the table when decisions are made so we're not doing work in isolation. And weekly, we get to meet together and share like what's going on and try to, we support one another with some of the systemic things that are going on, but at a larger level, that's something that we're definitely looking at. We have some systems that are in place that are barriers for our students, families, and even our educators. So you'll be able to share some of that with us in the, in the future. Absolutely. Okay. I'm looking forward to sharing that with Wonderful. you all. Mm, one more. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Just, I, I won't keep going. But you did mention um, one of the conferences you attended had a focus on HR. Mm -hmm. And so could you share about some of the work you're doing? Because retention or attaining um, educators of color has been a focus of this board for quite some time. Is Can you talk about some work you're doing with our HR? Yeah, so right now the current work that I'm doing is looking at the job descriptions and ensuring that we are putting out job descriptions with an equity lens. But what I would like to say is that the messaging is really important and I'm just gonna use me as an example. So oftentimes I go through the buildings and I hear like different conversations of people saying like, oh, the board wants to hire people of color. We're gonna hire people of color. That's our goal, right? So it's all about the messaging. But when I hear that, right, I often think in my car driving home like, did you all hire me because I was black or did you hire me because I am smart, I've spent years doing DEI work, I have merit behind me, I'm invested in this community, and the, the magical part is that I'm black. But did you hire me because of my merit, or did you hire me just because the board is trying to hire someone black? So I think it's important that when we're talking about hiring people of color, that we're talking about hiring quality of people of color. And when we talk about like retaining people of color, it's not just at the, the school level, but it's at the district level, and it's also at the board level. We have to make sure that people feel welcomed, and we have to make sure that they feel like they belong, and we have to make sure that they feel supported. So when we're talking about like hiring and retaining people of color, we have to talk about how we're messaging that, because I don't want to be your token kid from Middletown. I bring a lot more to this position, and I, you got a small snapshot of that tonight, but just imagine what I could do in a full year about what I did in six months. So I think it's important about the messaging. I think we have to look at how we're recruiting people, having everybody on the same page about like what type of profile of a candidate, candidate that would want to work in Middletown. Those are things that we need to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waters. And um, I truly appreciate I, the, the uh, Mr. Grizzle, you can come up, but um, I truly appreciate the questions that the board um, is asking because as we're showing these presentations, some of those questions will be answered as you see the, these presentations and it will actually demonstrate the, co the cohesiveness of the work, the through line that happened between each of the departments and how we inform each other of our practice and to be intentional. And so the next presentation we, we will share with the board is actually um, a couple of months ago we shared the staff um, survey that was um, uh, conducted throughout the district and we shared, uh, Mr. Griswold shared the results of that um, survey and we did mention that we would uh, then conduct the student and family survey um, through the panorama. And so um, we will share with the board tonight and the community um, the results of those, uh, of those surveys and answer any questions. Mr. Griswold. Hello again, everyone. Um, and as Dr. V mentioned, in April, I reported to findings and trends from our school, staff, culture, and climate surveys. 
Tonight, I'll share with you our initial results from our culture and climate surveys for our two other important stakeholder groups, our students and our families. Tonight's presentation is an initial overview as these surveys were just closed last Friday. Uh, in the coming weeks and months, the more detailed results will continue to be shared with our community as we dive into the data to find successes, challenges, and potential solutions to those challenges. For this surveying, we partnered with Panorama Education, an industry leader in reliable surveying for schools. Um, partnering externally helps us to maintain anonymity and to manage the execution of the survey. We selected four to six question sets or topics that you'll see presented. And these topics and questions have gained reliability through their wide use nationally and over time. The surveys were distributed to all students and classes in advisory periods and to all families via school messenger. The surveys opened on May 31st and closed on Friday, June 10th. In total, these results represent responses from 550 families and 1,409 students. Families with students in any grade could participate in the survey. Only students in grades three through 12 were asked to participate in the survey as younger students would require more teacher support, thus introducing a bias to the data. The following slides represent the initial steps in the culture and climate improvement process. The surveys act as our district checkup allowing us to see what is healthy and what might need more attention in all of our stakeholder groups. With a full data set of responses from staff, students, and families, our coming analysis will allow us to provide more coherent solutions. It is also important to know that some changes for improvement are already underway, but will take time to show up in survey results. The first survey topic is school climate. Questions in this category included how fair or unfair are the rules at school? And to what extent do you think that children enjoy going to your school, among others? Our students in grades three through five have the most favorable view of climate, including 74% who perceive that their teachers are excited to teach their classes. Our grades six through 12 students have the lowest view on school climate with 74% reporting the energy of their school as negative. And these are just snapshots, so examples of questions that were asked. In the area of school safety, questions included, how often do you worry about violence at your school? And overall, how unsafe does your child feel at school? Uh, third through fifth grade students feel the safest at school, and 77% believe it's not likely that they will be bullied online. 57% of surveyed families have a favorable rating of school safety overall, but 69% at least sometimes worry about violence at their child's school. Students were surveyed about their feeling of belonging at school, while families were surveyed about the concept of school fit. Questions included, how much respect do students at your school show you, and how well do the activities offered at your child's school match their interests? Again, our third through fifth grade students have the most favorable responses and 81% of them feel that they receive strong support from the adults at school. On the other hand, only 30% of six through 12 students had favorable ratings of school belonging, with 50% sharing that the behavior of other students hurts their learning at least a little bit. Finally, questions about engagement for students included items such as, how excited are you about going to your classes, Questions for families were about the concept of barriers to engagement and asked them to assess access factors, including family busyness, the school feeling welcoming, and negative personal memories of school. 89% of families feel that schools communicate with them well, even through potential cultural differences. For students, for student engagement, only 12% of students engage six, in grades six through 12 feel quite or extremely excited about going to their classes. So as this data set is only a few days old, it is safe to say that we, probably like you, have more questions than answers at this point. In the coming days, weeks, and months, leaders will use the data to engage in designing improvements, 
Um, I'll soon be updating the Culture and Climate Survey website with this data, and that site will again be shared through our internal and community-wide newsletters. We'll also be looking at ways to improve our surveying processes, including looking at where they fall on the school calendar and how they are deployed. Finally, we will improve the content of the surveys to ensure that we use inclusive language throughout the various tools. Members of the community have provided necessary and constructive feedback that some of the survey items utilize gendered language. Such language serves to marginalize, working against our larger purpose of hearing the voices of all of our stakeholders. For that, we're sorry, and we'll learn and do better. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. For the benefit of um, approaches, is there a demographic breakdown on some of these responses? So there is demographic breakdown of responses um, most, uh, most fully for our students um, because we are able to, while conf we maintain student confidentiality, but we associated each response with a student's ID. So that's done on the back end with Panorama. That's why we, we contract with them. Um, but that gives us demographic breakdown. Um, for families, it was um, voluntary. So that maintained their anonymity. So this question is to Dr. Vasquez Matos. Um, for the purpose of the board and conversations, might we get that data at a later time? I understand we're just a week out um, so that we can look at policy, we can look at curriculum in, in de you know, all aspects. Can we have that? Absolutely. Um, uh, like Mr. Griswold said, we, we just concluded this on Friday. Um, and we haven't done, as a reminder, we haven't done this survey um, since 2018, 19. And that was for staff. We haven't done the family and student survey since 2017. So this is, this is also new to our families and staff, but it is an important uh, set of data that, that is, that's going to guide many conversations in the coming months with the board and, and other stakeholders. Thank you. <clears throat> Just the initial information, I'm, I'm concerned, and it's a little alarming. Um, are you going to, Dr. V, put a, together some type of um, committee, and what is your overall plan? Do you plan on providing that to the board to let us know? I, I know this is something you're going to have to work on in the summertime. If you could provide a plan to the board to let us know how this will be addressed, that would be great for the board. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. Um, this was also um, very concerning for me as well as my team. Um, you know, and, and even just talking already um, with some principals um, as it relates, especially our middle school and high school, if you can see the data, um, those numbers are are concerning and this is student voice and agency right because this is a way for families and students to really uh, present what is their experience or or their perceptions or 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 their story um, and um, there, there's a there has there is a sense of urgency to develop a strategy and a plan to address this hence why you probably saw with dr. waters around you know her work. Um, how does that actually be part of uh, part of it? Um, as you are probably aware, we are also reimagining the Beeman, um, uh, moving Beeman's from trimesters uh, to semesters because that was a barrier for at least you know 400 of our students who were not participating in in, in some courses, and so that is being revamped. And so um, this is this. Um, um, is a priority um, for me, um, hence for, for, for the team. And I absolutely will, um, when the board wants um, to bring back, you know, what is the strategy of how we're going to begin to address and really start to kind of um, um, really take a deep dive into what this data is telling us. Um, I, I really think that some things need to be put in place before school starts. And, um, you know, what might not hurt is to put in place some town halls, um, even with the parents or um, as well as with the teachers for sure, just to 
give them an outlet to voice their opinion and really a safe place for them to say, hey, this is what is going on because I have heard whispers and um, I said, we are not going to be able to, the board is not going to be able to do the administrators unless you come forward to say, these are the issues that we can address them. And hopefully we'll be able to do that and, and give them the opportunity to voice their opinion. Because it matters. Because if the teachers are miserable, I'm telling you, the students are going to, our students are not oblivious to that. They feel that. They know when adults are not, they're at a place where they, um, they're not feeling it. And so I don't want our students to feel, to be in that environment. And I don't want anyone to work at a place where they feel like, you know, they're miserable either. So I think it would behoove all of us to really work together with our students, teachers, and parents to cultivate a better environment. Madam Chair and Dr. V, can I just ask, um, you know, the, the elephant is out of the room, and I think that, you know, now we just have to take the bull by its horns. We've heard about it. Now we see it, and there's no denying it. This is opportunity. It, we don't have to, you know, be, I mean, it, it's not a great thing, but this is going to turn out to be a good thing. I feel good about what is going to come of this. Um, because this will be transparent information. And I just wondered how we will measure progress going forward. I, I think I heard this information is going to be on the website. Will we do this survey again the same time next year to see, OK, well, now 31% feel better, or you know, um, just to measure, um, because I think Otherwise, we'll get stuck here as a community, you know. Absolutely, and, and that's, a great, that's a great question, and, and I appreciate also the comment. Um, as, I, as, as we continue to reflect on this, I think one, one thing is actually we have to use the data to inform. And so to Madam Chair's point around, you know, engaging the stakeholders, teachers, principals, families, and, and giving them the opportunity to really look at the data, because the data is telling a story. And how are we going to change the narrative? To your point, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Rose Daniels, to, to the positive, right? There's, there's an opportunity here. Um, and, and the point, the, the goal is actually to, to conduct this, um, this um, survey again um, in the fall or late fall, early winter um, to do, do an, another check-in. I think we have the opportunity Correct me, Paul, I'm run to do it twice a year. Correct. Oh, I've, I've participated in surveys, you know, on uh, employee engagement, and one of the really important things is, you know, you develop the action plans, but also to communicate the action plans, and to make sure that people are feeling that, you know, we, we've, is anything gonna be done with the survey? And it's so important to keep communicating, not just sending out another survey, it is to make sure that you communicate out what you're doing and, and actions that are taken so that people think that it's being taken seriously. And I like how Deb says that. Very important because me, as an auntie, as a grandmother, I want to now I have to go back and question my relatives who are sitting in a system, how they feel being a part of a classroom and not feeling the excitement with an adult in the room that's supposed to be educating this individual who was supposed to be making it out to go to college. I am very concerned as a, just generally as a, you know, a relative. Dr. V, please, please do something. That is a very scary number. 12% is a very scary number. Very scary. Very scary. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I just want to say, you know, it's a lot of weight to put on a superintendent. Work like this 
requires all hands on deck. And I'm not discounting your comment, um, board member um, White. I'm just saying, like, we can't, you know, even the community who is hearing this for the first time, we can't turn to Dr. V and say, fix this. This is a community issue. Our schools are community schools. And we also have to keep in mind, this is the voice of our children speaking right now. And so this is where the work, you know, the, we, we need to understand further from them what, what is really happening. And, and I'm, I'm glad that we have a DEI a program here functioning. And I don't know how you're going to clone yourself. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do all of it, but I believe you will, and um, we're glad you're here. I don't want you to think I'm pressuring you, Dr. V. I'm just, I'm just pleading with you in the sense that I have relatives out there, and they are part of this specific data because I care. May, may I add one more, okay, one more piece ahead. of this? So um, I appreciate the attention to, to the headline of, sort of uh, our 612 data and what that says. Um, I think it's also important that we learn from where successes are too, right? So our, there's a lot of positives in our elementary data. Um, and even we had breakdown by school for families and students as well. So it, it's an opportunity for us to replicate some of the great, learn about and replicate some of the great things that are happening there and see if the solutions are already in our schools and with our leaders and our teachers um, as a starting place. So this data gives us a lot of information and um, it's, it's our, our charge to now use it to its fullest extent to, to find solutions to the challenges, but also to, to highlight and replicate the successes. Um, so Paul, what percent, you identified that there are 1,409 students who took the survey do you know what percentage of those students are in grade 6, 12, and then what percentage are elementary? I was trying to avoid the feedback there. Um, so I do have that um, breakdown in the data. I don't have it with me right now. Um, I would also say we did have the challenge of doing surveying up against our standardized testing season, so asking for our teachers to give more time away from instruction um, did decrease our overall percentages um, more than we would have liked. So talk about processes and improving where it falls on the school calendar. Um, that's going to be a decision we have to make. We want it towards the end of their year to get a full year's worth of data, but that's also when all of our testing takes place. Um, so I, I don't have the exact numbers of our 3 through 5 and, and 6 through 12. Um, that's something it could produce um, and will um, include in these, uh, the, the Culture and Climate Survey website. And then does the survey um, ask open-ended questions? The survey... Um, asked one open-ended question of students, and that was um, what does high quality instruction look like to with some version of wording of that. Um, that was um, in support of um, our, our data around school engagement, but also our work we're doing in developing our instructional vision for the district. Um, so we had 700 open-ended responses to that question, and that's completely, all the questions are completely voluntary. Um, and as far as um, parents um, with the state statute of um, parents and family, with the state statute um, of uh, the remote learning option for districts to, to either create or allow a remote learning option, um, we asked our students uh, or our families um, to openly respond to, would you be interested in this option? And if so, why? So those were the open-ended questions we had. And, and as I understand the panorama survey, there are like banks of questions that you can select from, right? That's correct. Okay, and is there, thinking about Dr. Waters' presentation, particularly as it related to her like equity walkthroughs, is there any potential opportunity to link the panorama survey to the equity walkthroughs to think about like specific look-fors that might come up in the panorama survey but also might be guided by the equity work that she's doing? So the of the banks of questions, um, there were questions in our staff um, survey questions that we were able to choose from from Panorama. Um, and actually, Dr. Waters and I collaborated on um, the choice of those questions. Um, those banks did not exist in the Panorama question sets um, for, for students. And the one that's probably the closest relation is the barriers to engagement um, for the families. So we did have that question set of 10 or so questions. Um, uh, the, the benefit of using their question sets is it gives you 
um, a connection to their national data set and where you fall in national norms. So that was actually my last question. Do I, I know that Panorama provides that. It, will that be on the website or will you provide that in some other way to show how this data compares to national norms? Um, yes, so I would, I would say there might be a caveat to that. In, um, Panorama has not updated their national norms um, or have not changed their national norms since post-pandemic. So um, their data set includes kind of a very different version of school and um, attitude towards school. And it does not reflect a like a stopping point in a new data set. Assessment companies tend to update their norms every two or three years. Panorama hasn't done that. So um, that'll be, a, 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 I guess, a conversation we have with our partners at Panorama as to what that could look like. Hi. Oh, I just wanted to add something. Let's state your name for the man. Dina Ford, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I think there's a big correlation between how we talk a lot about teacher burnout. Well, there's also student burnout when it comes to those assessments and testing, and that where that you know it ties to where students aren't excited to go into the classroom to sit and do a three-hour test and things like that because um, we see a lot of excitement I think in the elementary schools especially those younger grades because they're so involved with you know these fun exciting activities and um, you know they're not being challenged yet with those standardized tests at those earlier grades and um, I just think like you said we could learn a lot from the younger grades and how there can be a lot of excitement and fun in the classrooms. Um, I think of my daughters in preschool in, in town, and for about two weeks I had to hear about caterpillars, and the butterfly was gonna be released, and she was excited to go to school every single day because it was, you know, she was gonna be able to have a little report. So I think we can get back that excitement if we start focusing back on what's really important in the classroom. Any other questions? Okay. So we'll look forward to your feedback, Dr. V, on this. We'll, we're, we'll all work together, and um, this too shall pass. There's always a situation in, uh, in life, and we work through the difficulties, and we move forward. So uh, that's what I look forward to out of this whole panorama survey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griswold. Um, next item is an update on um, our strategic operating plan year one. And so um, again, this, these, this slide deck was sent. I'm going to kind of um, scan through these. Um, there's a lot of um, information in, the, in this plan. And there was also a chart sent um, to the board to complement the presentation. And so when we look at um, our, strategic planning, our strategic operating plan uh, 2024, um, elevating innovation, creativity, and equity, you know, we start with goal one, which is our teaching and learning goal. Um, and, and in that uh, goal one, we have um, subsections of culturally relevant uh, curriculum, personalized learning, instructional supports, early childhood education, and expand high school options and pathways. And so when we talk about culturally rele relevant curriculum, some of the accomplishments of uh, this academic year is that we scaled illustrative math to all fourth and fifth grade classes across the district with coaching support for teachers. We expanded our Black and Latinx interdisciplinary units um, and, and standalone courses for grades six to eight. And so not, not, not only does it uh, live in the high school, but expand it to the middle school. And expanded the work of the principles of learning from the IFL audit in order to create a district instructional framework. In personalized learning, we implemented the iReady into the tier one model. And students in grade two to 10 were um, assessed using iReady reading and math Maddox diagnostic in the fall, winter, and spring. And based on the results of the diagnostic, I already created individualized learning uh, paths for students. Teachers also used the diagnostic data for grouping and planning uh, purposes. We continue to expand uh, footsteps to brilliance to our students. 
When we t um, talk about in the instructional supports, um, we continue uh, uh, coaching and implementing the READ 180 and Re MATH 180. Um, READ 180 coaching visits and teacher PD took place throughout the academic year. We continue monitoring the effectiveness of subgroups and racial segments, um, examining our mid-year subgroups data from grades K to five, allowing us to strategize next steps. As it relates to early childhood, um, we expanded pre-K to school day, school year model. The current model at Snow pre-K will remain the same, four classrooms, part day classrooms, one classroom, the whole uh, entire school day. And then two intensive case management or ICM classrooms will be added to meet children's need in pre-K at Beelfield and kindergarten at Farm Hill next academic year. We developed um, uh, subsequently early learning uh, the SOP. This plan was completed in May of 22, um, and we are now in the uh, final stages of introducing the um, early learning uh, 2.0. As it relates to expand high school options, our accomplishments for this year, we expanded the aerospace pathways to include practical skill applications, internships, industry, industry partnerships, et cetera. In the summer of, of this year, the high school aerospace will partner with Brainard Airport and Meriden Airport for industry partnerships. We will continue to uh, monitor uh, the implementation of Innovation, Innovation Center at Beeman Middle School. The Innovation Center is fully resourced for the next academic year through grant funding. The director of STEAM has worked um, the innovate, with the Innovation Coordinator to ensure curricular alignment. We continue to explore the feasibility, well, we, we explore the feasibility of offering the seal of biliteracy for students. We are, are going to actually, for the first time in middle, uh, Middletown uh, public schools, graduating a number of seniors with the seal of biliteracy, um, which, was a, which was a pilot for this year. Um, explore needs of systemically monitor and manage the pathways options. And so that means that the pathway options fall into um, the high school departments in CTE, as well as in STEAM, and working with the director of STEAM, we are looking at pathways such as computer engineering, medical um, a pathway, um, um, as well as computer science. As it relates to our goal two, operation systems and structures, that falls into various sub components as in talent office and uh, talent office and performance management, communications, technology, student center funding, special education resources, facilities, meal service, and dining experience. And as it relates to 2.1, the talent office and performance management, we, we these years the compliments, we implemented a redesign and realignment of the talent management office, TMO. Um, uh, as well with aligned with the risk and insurance management functions to improve efficiency and support district goals. This including examining the recruitment, hiring, onboarding, or for certified, non-certified leadership and executive positions. We implemented an exhausted operation and functional talent management operation improvements in terms of day-to-day -day administrative functions and support systems. And design and implement performance management structures and professional growth strategies. As it relates to communications, many of our accomplishments include perform a communication streamline initiative by creating internal and external newsletters to keep um, MPS staff and students' family appraised of important news in the district. And you see that go out weekly, usually on Fridays, that that goes out the Middletown Minute. Um, begin building a communication infrastructure by establish, establishing internal and external communication advisory groups which have been meeting with our director of communications. We've improved our operational communication by implementing aspects from the communication audit, primarily through decreasing the number of emails staff receiving, increasing communication with families and community members, and ensuring all external communications are bilingual in English and Spanish since those are the two primary languages spoken throughout our district. And we completed the district website redesign and refresh um, and a new, it is, it, the new site is set to launch in August of this academic year. And as you remember, that was 
a, a major, that was a feedback as part from the board um, in, in providing us um, some guidance around what we'd like to see. As it relates to 2.3 technology, we continued the implementation of future ready schools. Um, Mike and his team and members of the finance team participated this year in cohort 15, uh, uh, the court, the next cohort of Future Ready, which are 15 school districts and Future Ready to develop our Future Ready Plan 2.0. Um, the design of one Middletown learning and performance management system where employees um, can go and actually um, get professional development, but the goal is also to have kind of a one-stop shop um, self-employment, um, uh, employees uh, system. As it relates to 2.4 student center funding, some of our accomplishments this year is that we developed and began implementing a four-year state and federal grant plan to assess facilities and educational needs. This is a living document plan that continues to be adopted. We continue to develop a quarterly reporting mechanism for the Board of Education of individual school offerings and the use of funds. As we talk about special education resources, we completed a special education audit with futures. Um, we developed a plan to prioritize the findings and implementation steps from the audit, um, continue to evaluate the programs and services that we provide to our students and family. This is critical because this connects to kind of the previous conversation around what the audit found of really separating special education needs and behavior supports and really having someone supervise us socially emotional learning. Of course, as, as you recall, so our investments in having social workers at every school and so forth. So um, that is an accomplishment for the district. As it relates to facilities, continue implementation of our five-year district-wide facilities plan. The five-year district-wide plan facilities plan continues to be a fluid document that is updated and prior to yearly based upon the building use, educational needs, and the budget constraints. And as you know, we have several summer projects happening in many of our schools uh, this summer. The meal and service and dining experience, um, many, uh, some, um, some board members were able to participate and see our uh, nutrition, uh, food and nutrition manager, uh, Mr. Uh, Randall Mel, who gave some innovative um, uh, updates around what uh, he is doing with his team. And so we, we begin experimentation of possible changes, improvements, to the meal service and dining experiences. You know, since December of 2021, several new initiatives have been introduced in the food service program, including Meatless Mondays, Local Foods Harvest of the Month, and, new, uh, and several new culturally thoughtful uh, menu items. Identify cultural and dietary needs that, uh, and conflicting USDA regulations, and several change additions have been made to the current menu to better meet uh, the needs and the desires of our students. Additionally, a USDA um, menu planning and management software was purchased, Mosaic is, is the name, and will be ready to launch in the fall, uh, was, was, was ready to be launched in fall of 2022 for the new school year. And we review and increase training for cafeteria and food staff using the One Milltown. We have created a series of school nutrition specific trainings to meet and exceed the USDA professional standards for our staff. As it relates to goal three, our choice and innovation models, you know, we have expanding learning opportunities, creating uh, creativity and innovation zones, professional learning culture and structures, innovation models. As it relates to uh, expanded learning opportunities, the onboarding of the coordinator of extended time in January uh, 22, who um, oversees many of our extended uh, uh, extended days and extended year programs um, 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 has been um, an accomplishment, accomplishment for the district. Um, begun to develop a plan to support extended time, maintain current and build new partnerships, and connect extended time opportunities to individualized student success plans. The student success plans will be piloted through the 21st century uh, after school programs, including a fourth grade cohort at Snow and cohorts in grades six through eight at Beeman. And we continue to seek additional local and federal grants to, uh, uh, su to support extended time. Two five-year grants were secured to create after-school sites at Beofield and Snow Schools with a focus on academic support and social and emotional learning. 
an educational two-year after school grant was secured to expand the 21st century summer camp to include up to 50 students from McDonough. Creativity and innovation uh, uh, zones continue to research effective practice models for grade list classes to use the seed time in order to develop a plan for the Middletown co uh, context. I would also add to there that we are in a research mode of also a meeting with um, our department head and our, uh, one of our principals tomorrow around uh, pursuing our first dual language school um, and for Middletown public schools. Um, professional learning and culture and structures. Um, develop a three-year district-wide professional learning plan and instructional framework to feature blended and personalized learning. A new vision for professional learning was developed to cohere with the SOP best practices and state and national standards, as well as department and school leaders began to use a new professional learning planning tool to plan coherent professional learning for the 22-23. And as you recall, the board did approve um, a cal academic calendar that allowed for additional professional development days um, that will allow opportunities for all employees um, to engage in professional learning. Innovation models um, implement phase one of Project Lead the Way is in grades three to five at Farm Hill. Grades three to five were able to complete the additional uh, PLTW, computer science module. We implement phase one of Project Lead the Way in grades K to five at Spencer. And phase two begins this summer with the training of grades three to five educators and implementing the whole school um, PLTW model. As we talk about goal four, equitable learning environments, um, those categories are family and caregiver partnerships, racial equity, social emotional learning, wellness, and mental health, school-based um, autonomy, safety, and security. Um, and so, as it relates to family and caregiver partnerships, we contracted with a translation and interpretation service provider to meet the needs of linguistically diverse families, which this program is available to all our families, family, uh, faculty, staff, um, and, and um, they have access to over 200 different languages um, for translation and interpretation. Shifted to making all communication with MFCs families and community in bilingual and Spanish. Um, uh, Reimagine and rehouse the work of the MCELI home visitors into, pupils, into the pupil services and special education department. At this time, the work is being redesigned through the best practices and an equity lens um, and working closely with department heads as well as uh, our unions. As it, as it relates to uh, 4.2 racial equity in the process of development racial equity plan, I'm not going to go into detail in this page because you've heard a presentation from Dr. Waters, and so you ha um, have more of a thorough um, like overview of that. As it relates to 4.3 SEL wellness and mental health, we rolled out the MCELI um, uh, at least at, at the last elementary school this year. We continue to have a sustainability conversation with the state and statewide partners regarding Project AWARE. We implemented the ruler SEL curriculum across the district. We ensure that all staff have access to the Middletown Social Emotional Learning Curriculum Share Drive and Supplemental Curriculum, Social Thinking, Zones of Regulation, Harmony, SEL, Empowerment. And in the process of expanding the DESA Universal Screener to middle and high school with the state and aperture, uh, DESA recently committed to fund a three-year contract and license to support this expansion. As a school-based autonomy, all of our schools have begun to implement this work and will continue to build it out in the next school year. Uh, school leadership councils continue to be established in all of our schools across the district. This work will continue into next year as part of the redesign work um, um, in pupil services. Uh, safety and security, we installed and have begun to implement the use of scholarship a student attendance system at Beeman and, and at the high school, we installed a program called Alertus, which is an internal emergency, emergency notification system in six out of our 10 schools. Um, in the process of developing a three-year plan and budget to address ongoing safety and security needs, including technology and equipment, you heard um, Cheryl um, uh, in her um, presentation, we were able to um, move up um, the security grant 
um, and find a, something to upgrade to, um, cameras and things of that sort throughout the district. And so we moved actually that grant up a year earlier. Made professional development for faculty staff around the emergency action guide available to the One Middletown platform. Um, and I know that was, that was a lot pretty quick, but um, if any, any board members has questions for me or we also have department heads and staff members here, I'll be more than happy. I have one question. Sure. I know, um, <clears throat> I believe last year or the year before, we started a partnership with Middlesex Community College where the students would be able to obtain a um, associate's degree. How is that going? Is that still in play? Or will we restart that program? So we do continue to have, you might want to give an update also on this, uh, Natalie Forbes. Ms. Forbes, do you want to come? Uh, this uh, this our Central Connecticut ongoing conversations around dual enrollment. Thank you, Natalie. Is that good? Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you for the question. Yes, um, we're making excellent progress with our dual enrollment with Middlesex Community College. Um, specifically, I'm speaking about uh, the aerospace program and the manufacturing certificate. Um, we had spoken previously that there are 10 um, courses that one has to take to achieve that. Um, and this year in our aerospace program, we have 37 students enrolled in dual enrollment uh, in two separate courses. Um, and that's a testament to the work of uh, Mr. Pelletier and Mr. Sokolowski. Uh, they worked out the agreement with the college. Um, they were accepted as adjunct teachers and they've integrated the work uh, from Middlesex Community College into their curriculum so the students are fully dual enrolled. Uh, there are other students in the program who have chosen to take additional subjects and they took, take those either in the evening or on Saturday mornings or throughout the summer. So that program has really uh, taken on. Very awesome. happy with that. And recently, um, we have begun over the last few months um, discussions with CCSU uh, supported by uh, three um, Pratt & Whitney employees as well who are on an advisory board at CCSU um, in the engineering department actually. So we've begun discussions about uh, dual enrollment firstly with our robotics and engineering and aerospace programs but the conversation uh, has the ability to expand to all uh, subject areas at CCSU. So uh, that is supported uh, out of the provost's office. And um, I will say that uh, CCSU, we hosted them at the high school and our students presented, both our engineering and robotics students who were very impressive right. uh, with all facets of the work and both of our aerospace labs and students. So they came to our site, they saw what we could do they were sort of wowed and they said, wow, we really have to step up here when we have you across. So we went across to CCSU. Um, they were extremely accommodating. We saw some of the marvelous uh, equipment, the new buildings that they have there, robotic arms, all of these things. And Mr. Falkenberry, with the engineering robotics program, said, I just can't wait to get my students here. Mm -hmm. um, so it was... An exciting afternoon, uh, we were welcomed, and there are many possibilities. Awesome, one question. Oh yeah, round of applause. Oh, yes. Um, so do we have any students graduating this year with dual? Um, you not, know? not fully graduating not fully? Okay. because we just really, this is the first, is the first year, year of the major okay. cohort. Mm. There are a couple of students last year, but this year, as um, I noted, it's expanded to 37 students, right. so it's very exciting. Well, I hope to see that one graduation. Yes. Thank you for the information, that was great. You're welcome. Any other questions um, in regards to the strategic operating plan that Dr. V went over? Oh, okay, Dr. Um, two questions. Um, I know that you've talked a lot about in developing an instructional vision. I didn't see it 
specifically called out in this document unless I missed it, but I'm wondering about the status of the vision. So um, that's actually, um, we didn't, I did not include in here because we are still, we're in the final stages of, 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 of rolling that out. Um, actually, the team was meeting today with um, educational elements, and they basically, um, well, they were scheduled to, to work until 12.30, and they were there until about 2. Um, so they had, a, I imagine, had an exciting time around really rolling this up and having conversations. But the goal is actually to um, um, have this in place for the fall of, of the academic year, the instructional vision. But I, Jen, uh, Ms. Kanata, and Mr. Griswold, who are, are kind of the co-chairs of, of this initiative, um, with other department heads, teachers, and principals um, can, can add more um, uh, detail. Dr. Vasquez Matos, um, great question. Today we did meet, um, we are meeting again tomorrow with um, education elements, and where we are right now in the process is we have a steering committee, and that steering committee includes uh, various members of um, our employees, so it's administrators, it's building level administrators, it's central office administrators, it's teachers um, from various content areas or from special education. Um, and it's important that all those voices are heard when we're establishing an instructional vision. Um, the other voice that we've taken time to hear from are our students. So um, most recently we've held focus groups and I wanna thank uh, Ralph D'Amato, the guidance director at Middletown High for helping us to arrange that. So. Uh, Paul and I, along with Education Elements, held focus groups so that we could hear students' voice about how their experience has been in the Middletown public school systems, what they can appreciate about that experience, and what they feel that they wish they had. Um, so we held four different groups. Um, there were three questions, and then through the discussions and conversations, other questions arose so that we could dig a little deeper about what they were looking for, or what they appreciated from a teacher, a class, or an experience that they had, K through 12. Um, so we are in the works of getting that instructional vision um, established. We still have multiple meetings. We'll meet throughout the summer with the steering committee. And then after the steering committee meets, we'll then send it to a second committee for feedback um, so that we can get together and look and decide what needs to be tweaked, how do we, um, change and make sure that it fits all stakeholders in the Middletown public school system. I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, no, just to add a comment about today's work was exciting uh, uh, first step in the design process of looking at our, our stakeholder data, so the empathy step in the design process, and then um, developing prototypes of what to include in the instructional vision and ultimately what it would look like to best communicate it. For that and then just a follow-up question I saw one Middletown referenced several times in this document and maybe my understanding of one Middletown is different than what it is or maybe one Middletown has evolved over time and you might not be in the best position to answer this question but maybe you are so is is one Middletown a staff facing platform is it a student facing platform is it both a staff and student facing platform It's, um, um, Ms. Forbes, you, you can come up and join me, but it, it's, the intention is uh, to be both an employee and student platform, okay? Um, and so we are working with um, the director of STEAM, but also um, others as it relates to prioritizing what needs, what goes onto the platform sooner than later. But um, not only you, you would probably have uh, the historical context of the. Yes, um, I, I concur that it is both a student and an uh, employee facing platform because um, from the point of view of trainings and uh, mandatory um, trainings and professional development, uh, that is available to all employees. So. For example, if custodians have to do a training, that can be put onto that platform and everything can be tracked. And what, what One Middletown was really about is having a central location to house not only trainings and professional developments and curriculum, 
that can be used both by students and educators, but also the idea of interoperable systems. So um, the new HRIS system will speak to other operational systems. They'll all speak to each other. There'll be the opportunity to pull data and information from, for example, employee compliance training into um, a dashboard, for example, that may be used at the end of a year by a principal when they're looking to see for um, a teacher which trainings they've done, which compliance trainings, which additional trainings, and so forth. So it's a long-term project, step by step. Uh, we have the compliance trainings up. We have access for teachers and students for some curricula in the STEM area in the middle, middle school age. Uh, and we're working on the HRIS system. So it's step by step. Ultimately, at the end, we're seeking to have interoperable systems. And is, is One Middletown producing the content or is the content found somewhere else and this is just a platform to access the content? So it's a platform where information that we choose um, to put up there in relation to training and PD, we choose that, we can create it also mm -hmm. and put it up. So it depends on, for example, if there's um, a state compliance training for DCF, for example, we can use a pass-through pass mechanism to connect to that, but the beauty of the system is that uh, we can track participation by our entire range of employees that had to take that training. So everything is pulled into one system rather than saying, you have to take this training here, and that training here, and then we have to somehow bring it all together and produce reports. This will bring everything together. And I saw that there was a, in the presentation that Dr. V just provided, there was some reference to professional learning um, for next year sort of being revamped. Would professional learning sit in the One Middletown platform? Is that where individuals would ultimately access some like asynchronous virtual professional learning opportunities? The vision um, for the future is that, yes, all of that would sit there, either connecting through other platforms or specifically through this one. Um, and Dr. V did reference, for example, um, food services has just uploaded all of their training. So now their entire group of trainings can be accessed there. And Mr. Mel um, is able to add or take away or update uh, through that system, complete with a data package that shows him participation, um, completions. He's able to get a dashboard uh, for participation on that um, on Middletown platform. Okay. Thank you. I know it's not the appropriate time in the agenda to ask this, but maybe a demo on One Middletown would be very helpful at some point, because I know we've been talking about it for over a year, and I, okay. I don't know if the other board members have seen it, but I haven't actually seen it. I think that was a request at one time, uh, a I couple can, of months ago, and yeah. I can arrange that. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Madam Chair. Ask a question with regard a follow-up question to what Justin's asking about one Middletown. Do we have a timeline on when we envision to have this fully functioning in the way that we desire to utilize it? So the HR function, the goal is actually to have it all completed by December, January, um, because that requires um, updating of job descriptions, making sure the codes are right and so forth, and then moving on to the payroll module. And so um, that, that phase, uh, that first phase, um, the goal is that it's completed by January. Question? Hey, uh, last item um, on the superintendent's report is the uh, DACO bus um, agreement contract. Um, this was uh, presented at the, um, the finance committee, <laughs> I was going to say the workshop, 
Um, and so I'm going to um, ask our transportation ma manager, Mark Langton, and our consultant, Richard, to please come up and um, kind of give an overview of um, the contract, which is an action item um, on, on the agenda for the board. Good evening, Madam Chair, fellow board members, Superintendent Dr. Vasquez Motas. Motas, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, so, Rich Labrie, uh, I'll introduce him next, uh, has been our busing consultant uh, now for over 10 years. Uh, Rich has been involved with our previous two five year contracts uh, with that and helped negotiate that and, and also develop a cost savings uh, for each one. So, it's been a real benefit. Um, again, as Dr. Vasquez Mato said, we presented to the Finance Committee last night. Uh, Rich has a quick slide presentation, which we had sent to you Thursday uh, for that power uh, slides. And then also there was a copy of the proposed contract uh, for a four-year extension uh, of that contract, uh, which we would recommend moving forward with in light of everything that we see out there with, with uh, other municipalities and uh, uh, some busing uh, situations that they're incurring. Um, we've been fortunate, certainly we've, we've had a reduction of buses. We're looking to bring some more back to uh, assist uh, the loads that are on the buses. Um, but I think what Rich has been able to put together uh, with DADCO is uh, something we should move forward with. Rich Labrie. Thank you. For those of you that have been on the board for a while, you probably saw me about uh, four years ago uh, at this time. Uh, as you know, you're coming off of a five-year contract uh, that uh, was a very favorable five years ago to the school district. Uh, you had basically two and a half percent increases uh, each year uh, over the term of that contract. Uh, and things that have happened uh, in the industry uh, uh, lead me to think that uh, initially it may make more sense to try to negotiate an extension of that current contract as opposed to going to bid. And one of the questions I ask when I come into a school district uh, is, are you satisfied with the quality of service that you're getting? And is the cost reasonable? And if the answer to that question is yes to both, then we start to look at uh, negotiating uh, an extension on the contract as opposed to uh, rebidding the contract. Uh, and as Mark said, uh, the transportation industry uh, itself, uh, including the economy in general, is very volatile at this, at this point. Uh, and what we're seeing, uh, or what we found, is that in our first uh, negotiation session with DATCO, uh, we found that they had uh, just uh, signed a new collective bargaining agreement uh, with the Teamsters Union. Uh, and that uh, agreement basically increased wages and benefits by about 16%. And one of the reasons they did that is that they presume that uh, being uh, tied in with the Teamsters will allow them to both retain and recruit quality drivers. An issue that they've had, uh, it's a nationwide sh shortage of drivers, as you know. Uh, all private contractors are suffering from that, uh, and something needs to be done both at the national level and the state level to create a larger pool of potential drivers, but that's a separate, separate issue. Uh, one of the things that's important to think about is that if you were to rebid this contract and a contractor were to bid on it, uh, and if they were to acquire or hire 50% or more of your current drivers, which given the driver shortage they would have to do, uh, they would have to recognize that Teamsters contract and the Teamsters collective bargaining agreement. Uh, that would prohibit a number of contractors from wanting to bid on this contract. The other thing going on in the industry is that most private contractors are suffering to meet the, uh, the, uh, the contract that they have in terms of numbers of buses and drivers. One of the reasons for that, as you know, is that during the COVID school closures, many contractors were not paid the full amount of their contract, uh, and some of them are trying to recoup that lost revenue in the next contract going forward. And the result of that is that we're seeing for first year cost increases across at least Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island and New York, where we do an extensive amount of work, uh, we're seeing anywhere from 12 and a half to 40% uh, cost increases in the first year of a contract. 
so when we look at that, uh, we, we suggested that it makes more sense to try to extend uh, than to rebid at this point, given the risk. Uh, the wild card right now uh, is the cost of fuel. Uh, and for those contractors that pay for fuel, their crystal ball says that fuel is going to go to $10 a gallon uh, inside of five years. And they're going to build that cost into the first day, cost per day per bus. Uh, in your case, you pay for the fuel, so you take that risk away from the contractor, uh, which, is, which is a relatively good thing. Not that, the, not that you're going to save money on fuel, but you take that risk away from, from the, the contractor. Uh, one of the things that this new proposed contract includes uh, is 12 additional uh, vehicles. Uh, as Mr. Langton uh, alluded to, uh, there's been a shortage of drivers, a shortage of buses, there's overcrowding on buses, buses are uh, uh, arriving late uh, to pick up, or they're ex driving off early in order to meet the next schedule. Uh, there's dis ongoing disciplinary uh, uh, issues on buses because of overcrowding. Uh, and the 12 additional buses will help you both with regard to fixing um, most, if not all, of those problems but also creating for you the capacity to manage change during the school year. And as you look at bell schedule changes going forward and other types of reconfigurations for educational purposes, transportation being a support service has to follow suit and be able to adjust to meet those uh, requirements. And in order to do that, you need some capacity. Uh, and right now you don't have the, uh, that type of capacity. $177,000 of, uh, of, of new vehicles. Uh, I included in the handout the, the cost of living index that uh, we look at uh, pretty much every month, uh, we download it from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's the Northeast Urban uh, 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 Index that we look at. Uh, and if you look at just April to April, uh, the, the cost, uh, the, the COLA increase was 7.17%. Uh, since we, uh, the slide was done, uh, the Bureau, uh, as posted May to May, the difference in May to May was 7.48%. And if you heard the, the speeches last night and the night before on television, they're predicting that inflation is going to go to 8% uh, before the end of the year. Uh, and the next slide shows the, uh, the projected uh, cost of living increase on a 12-month average. And you can see that the curve is going up dramatically. Uh, and it's not likely to come down uh, very quickly. Uh, we look uh, at the transportation budgets versus expenditures. Uh, and if you look at the red line, uh, DATCO expenditures have been well under your budget uh, since 2017-18. So under this current contract, uh, DATCO has been very, uh, uh, the DATCO contract has been managed very well by your, your transportation management department uh, and your finance department. Uh, if you look at the next slide, the projected DAT go to budget, uh, the fact is that uh, if the trends continue, the DAT go cost will still be less than uh, your budget over the next five years going forward. The uh, revisions in the contract or the agreement that we're recommending uh, is that the, uh, the contractor will provide 12 additional school vehicles. The annual cost increase will be 4.9% each year going forward, regardless of what COLA does. Uh, the contractor is going to provide seven electric buses, uh, six of which are type one buses, the big buses, one of which is the small bus. Uh, it will give us an opportunity, and I say us and I say transportation management in particular, uh, the opportunity to test electric vehicles in Middletown to see where they fit, how they fit, uh, and whether uh, they want to uh, move forward with more EV vehicles in, in the future but it'll give us a good baseline data to, to start with, uh, with uh, EV vehicles. Uh, given that their overhead is going to be covered uh, with the uh, 60 vehicles in this contract, uh, they will discount any additional vehicle beyond the 60 by $75 per day per bus, because as I said, their overhead is already covered with the 60 buses. Uh, they will replace three of the current 71 passenger buses uh, with three comparable 77 passenger buses uh, giving transportation a little bit more flexibility uh, with regard to seating, especially at the elementary school level. Uh, the district will continue to pay for fuel, uh, including the cost of electricity uh, for the, uh, uh, the electric buses. Uh, there'll be an offset for the, your diesel fuel use uh, for those buses. 
Uh, the contractor shall continue to discount your extended year buses and will continue to pay for summer fuel. Uh, the summer fuel gets charged to the uh, contractor, not to the district. Uh, in the event of school closures, however, the contractor will be guaranteed payment for a minimum of 180 school days at the cost per day per bus uh, for that particular year. Uh, we think that this is a, pretty much a non-issue because, uh, as you know, uh, probably better than I do, uh, the public doesn't no longer has the appetite for school closures uh, to the extent that we had during COVID. Uh, but uh, in the event that there are school closures, one of the factors in the past has been uh, treasurers, town finance committees uh, have been hesitant to pay contractors because it wasn't in their contract to be paid. And so all of the bidders that we've seen uh, on new contracts are either requiring it in their contract or they're bidding uh, with a contingency uh, that their bid is based upon 180 days of guaranteed service. Uh, the contractor will also continue to provide a 1.5% credit uh, for contract prepayment. Uh, and the contractor will maintain a no-strike provision uh, in their uh, collective bargaining agreement. Uh, one thing you don't have in your slide that uh, your attorney required was that the contractor will follow district policy regarding student records and student information. Uh, the next slide, uh, as we looked at uh, comparable information uh, amongst uh, area school districts that have gone to bid, uh, and as you can see in the yellow, uh, Middletown is, is positioned very favorably uh, with the cost of uh, uh, transportation uh, with area school districts uh, that are similar in size and demographics to, to you. Uh, you'll see at the, at the bottom, uh, I noted two Massachusetts districts, uh, only because I'm working with them uh, now. Uh, I didn't do their bid, but they called me after they opened their bid uh, because they both saw a almost a 30% increase in the first year cost uh, with a cola cola for the following two years. Uh, so they're looking over a three year period at probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 35 to 37% uh, cost increase. Uh, the next page basically shows the, the finances, uh, which includes uh, all of the things that you currently purchase under, from DATCO under your current agreement, including monitors and summer work and charter and fuel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look halfway down, you'll see your average vehicle cost. It, your average vehicles are going from 48.21 vehicles this year to 60 vehicles next year. Uh, and the, the uh, average vehicle increase, as I said, going forward would be 4.9% uh, for this year and 4.9% each year going forward. Uh, the next slide shows the rel relation of the uh, DATCO cost to your contract. And if you look at the straight li dotted line, uh, you'll see that the DATCO cost is going to be less than what you're currently contracting, uh, currently budgeting for. Uh, and uh, But I do caution you, uh, the cost difference between what DATCO charges the district for transportation uh, you pay for additional things uh, in your budget. Uh, as an example, you pay for the fuel. Uh, you also pay for transportation management costs. So there's about $500,000 of, of expenses beyond the DATCO cost that, uh, that uh, go into your budget. Oh. One question, well, is that that's not taken in consideration here when you, in your projection, is it? Uh, not in this one, but in the previous one, it, it, uh, it, it is. Uh, therefore, uh, our recommendation uh, is that the current transportation agreement with DATCO of New Britain be amended for fiscal year 23 and extended through fiscal 27 uh, at an annual average cost per bus increase of 4.9% annually and according to the terms and conditions as stated in the second amendment to the agreement dated May 27th, 2022, noted as the, execute, as the execution version. Uh, the reason I note it that way is that uh, over the course of the last two months, we've had probably six iterations of the of the agreement going forward, uh, and there were a lot of copies floating around. So uh, we made a note not only of dating it May 27th uh, after your attorney had reviewed it, uh, but noted it as the as the uh, uh, the, the version to be executed. Uh, 
given that, uh, you know, I know that there were a lot of questions last night at the at the budget committee meeting, uh, but uh, I'd be happy to answer whatever questions I can for you tonight. I guess I just had a question about like Teamsters. So this, what is this, a union? It's, it's, the, it's, it's the largest the union, uh, one of the largest unions in the country. Uh, and they're primarily the union for chauffeurs, drivers, uh, truck drivers. Uh, uh, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the advantages of, of, of having a collective bargaining agreement with the Teamsters is they have, they have truck drivers who retire every year. Uh, and they have truck drivers who work part-time every year. They have truck drivers who are self-employed uh, that are members of their union. Uh, and there's a potential pool of drivers who already have CDL licenses to be able to obtain a school bus endorsement to be able to drive. Um, I guess my only concern is, you know, we have to have buses. That's just the bottom line. Um, but I just want to make sure that our students are safe and that there is enough seats and our school buses are not overcrowded to the point that it does cause behavioral issues. So I just want to make sure that, you know, I know we have buses with um, extended seating. Just want to make sure that we're covered and our students have a seat when they ride on the buses. There have been stories that uh, in some of the elementary runs that students have been sitting on the floor of the bus uh, because of overcrowding. Uh, but the 12 additional vehicles should eliminate that problem going forward. I, and you know, I was surprised because I never heard that until last night. So that's concerning. It, it's, not a, it's not an everyday occurrence. It's just an occasional occurrence from, from what I was told. Should never happen. It should never happen. Is no, correct. that is from an insurance perspective. From it's a risk. Legally, it really legally, it should not Le happen. It, absolutely, and so I want to make sure that the district is safeguarded from anything. Mm -hmm. Should that happen again, we need to send a cab or a, a carry all or something to prevent those things from happening. But if we have the um, buses with extra seats and we are sure to have enough drivers. Hopefully those things do not occur. Hopefully so. Okay. Any questions, any concerns about the contract? We had our meeting last night. We did ask quite a few questions. And so um, if we don't have any other questions in the action item section of the agenda, we will vote for um, the uh, update to the contract, to the bus contract, the amended contract. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, one question. Uh, should I stay for the action item uh, in case there are questions then? Um, you could. Okay. We'd love to see you to the end of the meeting. <laughs> I'll never tell anyone to go home. <laughs> okay, hold on. Uh, and need needless to say, you know, should members of the board have questions even after the contract is signed, you, you let uh, Mr. Langton know. Uh, he has my email. He has me on speed dial. Uh, we're happy to uh, provide uh, technical assistance going through as you implement the contract. Thank you. Just one comment. I don't have any really? questions tonight because I watched the, the, the YouTube from last night. Y'all had a lot of really great questions, so I do appreciate that. So if anybody hasn't seen it, I just would encourage you to because it will probably answer your question. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're all set in your section, huh? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Dr. V. All right. Now we're going to move to the committee reports. Please, ma'am, please, sir, let's move very quick. Excuse me. We, uh, we, we need like a three minute break. Okay. Everyone needs a break or just one person? Several people. <laughs> okay. Let's take a three minute, I'll take a five minute recess, 936, if we can come back by then.
No. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me know when we're ready. Okay. All right, we're going to call the meeting back to order. The time is now 9.37. And at this time, we're going to go, uh, Mr. Wilkie. We're going to work, walk very quickly through our committee report. Um, one or two minutes, please. Please don't get the whole roster of who was there. Just tell us the gist of the Okay. The, uh, okay. the budget committee meeting, I just wanted to say that it was an interesting year and uh, I want to thank everybody for enduring me as the chair of that um, for the year it was complicated Cheryl in particular all the work that she did uh, last night's meeting we pretty much um, and all those people who are participating the, the Debras last <laughs> night and the, and Emily and all those others and the, the, the community person. So it was a pretty simple meeting last night. Uh, we did go through typical line items and uh, also the food services update, which was a really optimistic thing that came from uh, uh, Mr. Mel. And it was um, showed a surplus, so that was kind of a happy thing. The bus, uh, the presentation was the same as what you saw. Uh, I thought that was uh, excellent and I would strongly suggest that we a positive action on that. Besides that, it was uh, we went over the amended budget and um, personnel staffing and updates, and final legal cost uh, re related to the investigation. We started at 6:30. We ended at 8:30. That's it. Would you accept that? Thank you, uh, Charles. Do we have any questions for finance committee? Seeing that there are none, we'll be moving with the curriculum committee, the leader Rose Daniels. On June 4th, we had our curriculum committee meeting. At that time, um, Dr. Vasquez Matos and um, Ms. Lily Stewart and Dan Rauchi presented uh, information on an institute for learning um, audit that we had back in 2020. So they shared some of those results. The board did receive that um, audit information. Um, work has begun with regards to some of the feedback that was provided through that audit. And uh, Dr. Vasquez Matos did say that um, he would share at a later time uh, the findings and recommendations uh, with the board and community uh, at large. In addition to that, um, we discussed Beeman Middle School transition to quarters. Uh, Mr. Cordway and Ms. Daniels presented uh, the strategy that we'll be taking, the reason behind it, and um, some of the resolutions that they put in place to solve some of the issues as it relates to changing the new schedule. But what we did learn was that there were hundreds of students that are impacted by our current model, and we are a district that recognizes that all means all, so we'll be changing for the coming uh, school year. And then we had an opportunity to hear from Coach Smirnoff on the revised physical education curriculum. I believe he's going to share some information with the board at large tonight. Um, so we will wait for his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zelita. Any questions for our curriculum committee? Okay. Um, next is facilities. Uh, Mr. Dion in our packet provided some great details as far as what's going on on the facility side, um, but just very high level. Um, the feasibility study was um, provided to the mayor and we are hoping to have some type of community discussion this week not this week, this summer, in regards to some feedback on a new school. Um, I met with the Beeman Middle School Committee and we are currently going through our punch list. We have some items that will be addressed and um, ONG provided great feedback to let us know that a lot of things were updated. My only concern and request was that we would receive feedback from our teachers because they are uh, relatively in the building 
and they are the ones that are affected by the fixes, so I just want to make sure that they were okay with everything that was updated. The roofing project continues and moves forward. Farm Hill roofing will be replaced this summer. Snow School will have to go through the uh, state application process again. For Middletown High, the uh, translucent panel replacement project will occur this summer. Um, the HVAC replacement, Lawrence is completed. Bill Phil and Wesley are stated for this summer. Um, there will be some paving that takes place this summer for 210 and 311 Hunter Hill Avenue, and they're looking into possibly 372. Um, when I asked Mr. Dion, you know, some of the projects that he'll be working on, he said, really, storage cleaning he needs to see what's going on in the district, what materials there, just to get a um, feel for what's in our district and what needs to replace, et cetera. Our uh, last and final uh, committee meeting for um, this school year will take place next Wednesday, uh, June 22nd, and that will be a um, online meeting. So if you have any questions, concerns, feel free to email me or feel free to watch the meeting. Thank you. That's it for facilities. And at this, uh, any questions? No? Okay. We'll go to the policy committee, Justin Taylor. Thank you, Chairwoman Kane. The policy committee met on Tuesday, May 17th at 5.30 p.m. It was a virtual meeting. Most of my updates will come in the form of action items this evening. Um, we discussed about 10 policies, mostly in the 6,000 series, which deals with instruction. There is one policy that Dr. B decided to table in the meeting and that was policy uh, related to guidelines for evaluation and selection of instructional materials. Otherwise, all of the other policies will come before the committee this evening, or before the board this evening through action items. Our next policy committee meeting will be next Tuesday at 5.30 p.m., and that will be a virtual meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, everyone, for your committee reports. Um, and so at this time, we'll move toward the action item. The first item is the DACO contract. And um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Vasquez Matos, did you have any comments that you would like to make? No comment at, at this time, as it was in my uh, superintendent's report. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've um, received the information, the contract, you've looked at the presentation. We had our meeting last night that was open for questions. Um, and so I will uh, entertain a motion to accept the contract. Um, any questions? Okay. Is there a motion to accept the DACO contract that was made tonight? John Polino, I motion that we accept the contract as um, delivered by the gentleman in front of us and as the paper presented to us in our packet. Thank you. And is there a second? Okay, thank you. So it's been properly moved and second. Are there any questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Thank you. The next item is the amended budget approval. And so, um, Dr. V, I'll give you the floor, but um, we did have a meeting last week, and uh, the Finance Committee went through great detail as far as updates that will have to be made to um, our budget based off of what was allocated by Common Council in the city of Middletown. So this is our final process as it comes to the budget once we receive the feedback from Common Council and the city. Our charge is to um, vote on the amended budget. So do we have any questions? Um, Dr. V, did you want to go over anything just to give a high level overview of what you did? So. Um Yes, I can give a quick overview. Um, we presented this at the workshop as well as, as the finance uh, uh, committee meeting. Um, basically, we um, uh, decided to, um, in order to address um, uh, the reduction 
um, in our proposed original proposed budget after the Common Council meeting, we had to uh, mitigate um, a two point um, um, two point seven million dollars, um, and so we reallocated funds. We we uh, re did reductions in our budget as well as also cuts and, elim and eliminations with um, little to no impact to our local schools. And so what you have in front of you, it is the balance sheet um, uh, of the reductions um, that is proposed um, for the amended budget, totaling 2.7 million, 2.7 million, 28,907. Okay, any questions? No, okay. All right, is there a motion to accept the amended budget for the 22-2023 fiscal school year? For Gus. Okay, thank you, Deborah Gus. Is there a second? In John Polino. Second by John Polino. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? <clears throat> Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Thank you so much. Okay, action item C, and at this time, um, you have a guest to uh, provide some information on that. Yes, uh, this is actually, a, this is the um, uh, updated and revised physical education uh, standards, um, which has been up aligned to the state standards. Um, today with me is our um, Department Head of Physical Education and Health, Robert Smirnoff. This was also presented at the Curriculum Committee, um, um, mentioned by Ms. Rose Daniels. It is in your packet. Um, and overall, it is um, an updated curriculum um, in physical education um, um, that was due, due to the, the standards being updated at the state level. Okay, we'll have you at the podium. Uh, anything stand out this year or in the next couple of years in regards to physical education? Okay, wonderful. Any questions? Then we go thing, ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I know it's late. Is that the one question that I usually get asked is why is the standards going to the state of Connecticut? Is the standards going to the health? So the mm -hmm. health education, we will hopefully be in front of you in the next few months to help the updated health curriculum. But the state just passed new health standards literally about a month ago. So that was about an 85 page document. Thank you so much. 
any questions in regards to PE? Okay. All right. And is there a motion to accept the physical education curriculum? So move, Delita. Okay, move by Delita Rose Daniels. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I'll go with. I seem like I heard it down that end, but I don't know who it was. It was you. Okay, I'm gonna. That's right. That's why I had to do it. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Justin this time. You okay, Polino? Okay. I'm gonna give that second to um to Justin. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is, uh, we'll go right into policy. So let you lead the way, Justin. Thank you. Action item D is policy number 1260, the Civility Respectful Communications and Actions Policy. This is a new policy that was brought before the committee. It is not a mandatory policy based on the review from our attorney, but a model policy was provided by Shipman and Goodwin. Um, the purpose of the civility and respectful communications policy, as Dr. V reported, um, was to ensure that um, all constituencies in the district um, you know, uh, meet a minimum standard of decorum the policy committee all believe that the policy made sense and were in favor, so we request that we uh, adopt policy number 1260 as a first reading. Um, so I have a question and a comment. So if, if a parent or someone is disruptive, they um, would potentially not be able to come on campus? Is that what we have outlined here? That is correct. Um, and just under uh, examples of disruptive communication, it just says disruptive communication slash actions include, I don't know, it looks like a typo or something there. So if we could just correct that for the, for the um, second reading. Oh, I think that may have just been the way that it printed. I, I have it here. Oh, okay. So it does look good there. Okay. All right. So um, so it was moved. Is there a second? Second? Deborah Kane. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item E. Action item E is policy number 6141.3291. Uh, revision of the one-to-one -one device program. Uh, again, this is not a mandatory policy. However, the attorney recommended that we may wish to retain it. Um, the lawyer stated that the policy should re be reviewed due to the fact that it is outdated and much has changed since December 2020. Um, so the version before the board is a revised policy based on what's changed since December of 2020. Policy committee reviewed the document and is in favor of the revised policy. So I move that we adopt policy number 6141.3291 and its revisions as a first reading. Okay, is there a second? Second, Deborah Gus. Okay, second, Deborah Gus. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item F. Action item F is policy number 6141.5, replacement of the advanced placement postgraduate study policy. Um, the attorney recommended that we repeal our current policy and replace it with the Shipman model policy. Um, Principal Weiner uh, from Middletown High School spoke at length about the importance of making the changes that were recommended. Um, based on the policy committee's review, we supported the revised or replacement policy, rather. So I move that we replace policy number 6141.5 as a first reading. Second, Deborah Kane. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item G. Action item G. 
G is policy number 6145, the revision of the extra class activities policy. Again, this is not a mandatory policy. Um, Principal Weiner spoke about the policy and its implications for the middle and high school levels. The policy committee was in favor of the revised policy. So I move that we accept policy number 6145, the revised extra class activities policy, as a first reading. Is there a second? Second, Deborah Kane. Any questions? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item H. Action item H is policy number 6145.2, the revision of the athletic extracurricular activities policy. Again, not a mandatory policy, but it was recommended that we retain it um, with some revisions. Uh, there were some clarifications made in the second paragraph of the policy that reflected CIAC regulations. After review, the policy committee supported the revision of the policy. So I move that we accept revised policy number 6145.2 as a first reading. Is there a second? Second by Charles. Are there any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item I. Action item I is policy number 6146.1, the replacement of the grading system weighted grades policy. The recommendation was that we replace um, our current policy with the revised model policy from Shipman. Um, this would not change Middletown's continued policy of not weighting grades, um, which it has not done for years, um, but it changes some of the language in the policy, not in a substantive way. The policy committee reviewed the policy and uh, requests that we replace policy number 6146.1. So I move that we replace it as a first reading. Second, Deborah Kane. Uh, and are there any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item J. Action item J is policy number 6146.3, uh, the new or adopting the new policy of credit for online courses. This is a mandatory policy if the board wishes to offer credit for online courses. Um, there was a short dis uh, discussion, rather, regarding the policy, particularly as it relates to remote learning. Um, again, if, if that were necessary following um, what happened over the last two years, um, language is included in the policy for that to occur if necessary. Um, the board was in favor of this new policy, or the committee rather was in favor of this new policy. So I move that we adopt policy number 6146.3 as a first reading. Is there a second? Second, Deborah Gus. Um, I just have one question. So, if someone takes a course, can they take it from another high school or a specialized program? How does that work? So, according to the policy, the um, the course uh, material or a syllabus, if it's if, if it's a um, higher institution, must be presented to the high school administration for approval prior uh, to the student. Um, being enrolled in the online course in order to attain credit. Okay. okay, any other questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item K. Action item K is policy number 6164.12, the deletion of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome policy. Um, this policy is unnecessary as language um, similar to this policy appears in another policy that we have already adopted. So I move that we delete policy number 6164.12 as a first reading. Okay, is there a second? Second, Delita. Second, Delita Rose Daniels. Is, are there any questions? I'll see there are none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. Action item L. Action item L is policy number 6164.2, the proposed deletion of the guidance services policy. 
This is not a mandatory policy. The attorney recommended that we repeal it. There were no questions from the committee, and I move that we delete policy number 6164.2 as a first reading. Okay, is there a second? Second, Deborah Gus. Second, Deborah Gus. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposes? Seeing that there are none, the motion is carried. That was the last one, right? Okay, very good, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, well, our next meeting will probably be at the, well, official board meeting will probably be at the end of August. Yay. Oh, you guys don't look excited. I mean, I can put a couple of meetings on it. Okay. All right. So um, right now we're just going to um, temporarily end this meeting and we're going to go into executive session and then we'll come back and close out the meeting. Um, if you all can meet us out in the hallway. Um, and so I'll make the motion for the agenda uh, for the executive session. Um, is there a motion to enter executive session for the superintendent evaluation and leadership survey? Inviting in Dr. Vasquez Matos. Second, Second. Delita. Second by Delita Rose Daniels. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposes? Seeing that there are none, we'll go into executive session. It's now um, 10.03.